I just want to thank uh, everyone again. Uh, I really strive to work and uh, throw all my passion into places that have strong communities and that really have a passion for student, um, student voice. And so I'm here to be your steward. I'm here to do the hard work because that's you know, what brings us all uh, to this job that we love. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we have with us a student trustee from San Rafael High School, Talia Harder. Would you like to say a word of welcome? Yes, we are so excited to welcome you to Santa Fe High School. We have, um, I know that our students have been really anxious to hear um, who our new principal will be. Um, so it's really just so lovely to be able to hear from you and we can't wait to um, have you at our school. And I'll see if any of the trustees want to say a word or two. We'll start with Trustee Daly. I um, just want to say welcome. We're so excited to have you at San Rafael High. And um, we know that as someone who is bicultural, you will be a bridge for so many of our students. Um, and we just stand here ready and um, to help you succeed in any way. Justine Martin. Well, Joe, welcome so much. And um, like I said earlier, someone that's bicultural and has a respect and value for bilingual children and families. I'm super excited in the fact that you have a focus on student choice. So welcome, so excited to have you. Trustee Palmer. Mr. Dominguez, uh, welcome to San Rafael School District uh, for the fifth time. Thank you for being bilingual because that is something that I almost, you know, it was like requested 100%. I'm really excited because now 60% of our students will have a high school principal who will be able to understand our culture. Thank you so much. Vice President Martel Dow. Thank you, President Jackson. Welcome to the district, um, Joe. And we're excited to work with you. And as I mentioned before, we are a very collaborative district and we also really wanna work with you and support um, your transition as a new principal. So welcome. Okay, and I welcome you as well as all my colleagues, but I wanna note that you come from Lowell High School. And for a while I worked with the AIA, they have an urban plan program there. And so I, I don't know if it's still there, but I got to spend some time on the campus. And it's a fabulous campus for us to um, have your experience and observations. And I think you're just gonna be delighted with what you find at San Rafael High School. So, um, and with that, we have a tradition here of, um, what we coming around and shaking all of our hands. So you are the very first person to do this. And we all stand up. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. You come around on the inside. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Oh, it's okay. Yeah. It's been two years, everybody. Yeah, so it's fine. Nice to meet you. Oh, congratulations. Thank you so much. Welcome. 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 Thank you. Of course. Welcome. 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 Uh, moved by Trustee Palman, second by Vice President Martel Dow to approve the agenda. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, well, it's unanimous, five, five voting yes. Um, and so now we will come to resolution 2122-42 and I will turn that over to Superintendent Hogeboom to introduce this. Thank you. So this is uh, resolution 2122-42, which addresses anti-Semitism and affirms the value of Jewish students, staff, and families. So it's a real, rather lengthy uh, resolution, as most of them are. Um, we have had excellent student trustees this year, and uh, Sophia Weinstein was actually part of an uh, uh, experience at our local synagogue um, with Jared Huffman and a bunch of other important dignitaries, and she was selected to be a student speaker. So um, we asked her if she would introduce this motion and tell us a little bit about that event, and then we're actually going to play uh, a video clip from that event. So Ms. Weinstein, you want to take it over? Yeah, sure. Um, as you guys know, in the past few years, we had a rise of anti-Semitism, um, especially in Warren County, but it's just been worldwide, especially in the United States. Um, so the event was kind of just to have um, community members, so we had parents, 
I was unfortunately the only student. We had uh, some council members from the other cities in Marin County, as well as in Petaluma. Um, it was kind of just bringing, coming together and sharing our voices. A lot of people just kind of share their own experience with facing anti-Semitism. Um, and so we had a variety of speakers um, and it was kind of just a chance for all of us to come together and find new ways to combat anti-Semitism in the next coming years. Okay. Um, Ms. Perino, can you play that video for us? Yes, and I had to step out and I think it's going to be audio. I don't want to. Uh, <laughs> Excuse me. Let me. Let me. Let me. It's looking good. <laughs> <laughs> need to turn up the volume. Need to come up. Yeah, there we go. Oops, we lost the video. Mm -hmm. Just trying to figure out how to share it. Yeah, yeah now I get to share the screen. Yeah. Good job, yeah. <laughs> Hello, my name is Sophia Weinstein and I'm a current senior at Terlinda High School. I would like for you all to please imagine the scene. Feel free to close your eyes. Sing alarm filled the hallways and red lights flashed everywhere. A stampeded teachers and students quickly escaped my middle school and everyone was confused as to what was going on. I was standing with my teachers and classmates outside in the cold rain and brisk wind when police cars sped up into the parking lot to assess the situation. I was scared and confused and asked myself, is my school under attack? After a while now, soaking wet, we were told to go into the school across the street. I later learned that my school at the time, Brandeis Marin, received a bomb threat and other Jewish schools across the country had received similar threats over the past few days. This was a turning point in my life where I realized that my religion and community were under attack. I was always proud to be Jewish, celebrating holidays, cooking Jewish dishes with my grandmother, learning how to read Hebrew, and having my bat mitzvah here wrote of Shalom. I always thought that anti-Semitism was left behind in World War II, but I was quite obviously wrong. My grandmother escaped from Berlin to Shanghai, China with her family when she was seven years old. I remember her telling me childhood stories about living through fear, humiliation, physical threats, and when her grandparents were taken away to a concentration camp. My grandmother always said that she wished more Germans would have spoken up against the Nazis instead of just hoping things would change. During my junior year at Terralinda High School, Several Jewish students in my, in my county received anti-Semitic threats on social media. After personally experiencing anti-Semitism and witnessing my classmates being targeted, I felt that it was time to speak up. In light of these events, as a student board representative sitting on the Sander Falls City Schools Board of Education, I helped organize an interview with a Holocaust survivor that was broadcasted to all schools in my district. One of the questions that I asked her was, Today, students in Marin County experience anti-Semitism on social media. Not only, not only that, but our country is surrounded by anti-Semitism. Are the anti-Semitic acts that we see today vastly different to those seen in World War II? She had an immediate response. One of the largest mistakes I see today is people thinking that anti-Semitism was left behind. In my opinion, it has started to become worse. One thing I have learned about the Jewish people is that we are a community and group of survivors. We are survivors of countless acts of anti-Semitism from hundreds and even thousands of years. My Jewish classmates and I have been fighting to have a voice heard, to make a safer and more welcoming environment for Jewish students in my school, but to also address how we can combat anti-Semitism. Our Jewish community will continue to survive like we always have, but we need support. In order to address the anti-Semitism, it can't only be an effort by the Jewish community, but by all. Anti-Semitism and bigotry have no place in an inclusive and multicultural society, 
And we, the students, leaders, administrators, parents here today, need to become or continue to be an active voice fighting against anti-Semitism in Marin County and beyond. Thank you. Well, job very well spoken. So with that, we present um, the resolution 2122-42 for consideration. I move to approve the resolution. Okay. And we'll see if um, trustees have any comments or questions. And while we're doing that, we'll see if there's any comments from the public online or in the room. Being Sophia's teacher for four years and watching this young lady grow into the not only such a great speaker, she got her own placard here, which I'm so envious of. I mean, she's just grown into such an amazing young woman, and I'm excited to see all she's got to do. So. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm very proud of Sophia. It takes a lot to, you know, to say the things that you said, which are real, and it's true, and it, it, it did happen, and it is happening, and such a young voice to be heard. I mean, I'm proud of you. Thank you for representing us all. Is there anybody online? There is, um, there is one, but you have, um, looks like Trustee Daly. Okay, to thank you, yeah. Trustee Daly. I just want to add my um, sincere appreciation for Sophia sharing her story and sharing her humanity through that story. Um, Anti-Semitism is on the rise and it's incumbent upon all of us, um, especially people that are not of the Jewish faith, to call it out and to be allies. And so I'm, I'm really proud of Sophia and I really hope that we can find every way possible to try to support our, the Jewish community and make sure that we don't take things for granted because um, you know, as we've seen, little incidents can have a big impact. And so we need to do everything we can to stop that from happening. Thank you so much. And Talia, thank you. Yeah, I just wanna echo what everybody said and just thank you, Sophia. I think it's so critical that our community sees the impact of anti-Semitism and hearing from both young and old voices is so critical. Um, and just the way you speak is so eloquent and it's just really lovely to be able to hear you um, and hear your impact on our community. So thank you for the work that you're doing. Okay, and Vice President Margiela. Yes, no, the same thing as my colleagues and my friends and all, everyone has pointed out, we are very you know, lucky to have you as part of the board. And I also wanna tell the, the community as a whole that um, I think we are, very, invo very uh, involved in trying to make sure that the school is a safe environment for all. So the best thing that we can do right now is to work with what we can at hand to ensure that our students and our community feel safe. So what I wanna say, if there's a community in particular, in this case, the Jewish community feels is threatened, their safety is threatened, I think it's very important that we raise those issues so that administration and the board can really be aware and ensure that your safety and the safety of all is guaranteed. So I just wanna let everyone know that this is a space where everybody can come in and, and voice their, their issues and voice any kind of concerns around the safety of the students. And thank you for raising your voice. Thank you. We have the Colin, George P. Okay. George P, you can unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh -oh. Are you, you able to? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I've had the privilege and pleasure of working with Sophia uh, over the past year. And I must say she exemplifies many of the qualities that we need in our student um, advisory groups and also our student body in terms of real involvement and real commitment to community. And I must say that the Jewish community really reflects many of the most important values of community. And I think we could learn much from actually looking at the Jewish community and how it operates and how it takes care of all the members. And so I think Julia, I mean, she, she is an inspiration to me, continues to be, I am eternally grateful for having the opportunity to work for, with her. Thank you. You rock. <laughs> <laughs> Put that on the calendar. Thank you so much, George, for um, your comments on that. You you have been a steadfast uh, advocate for student voice, and it's it's always great to hear you um, speak up for our students when they come here. So um, we have a motion 
uh, by uh, Vice President Martel Dow and a second by Trustee Palma to um, adopt the resolution 2122-42, addressing anti-Semitism, affirming the value of Jewish students, staff, and family. Um, all in favor say aye. Uh, aye. aye. Okay, and I'll see if there's an advisory vote from our two student trustees. <laughs> and I see three eyes there. Okay, so thank you so much. I want to note that May is Jewish American Heritage Month. And although we're not quite there yet, uh, we adopt this resolution in the spirit of recognizing the contributions of Jewish Americans in our community and the, the voices that you represent. Um, in speaking up um, for social justice in our community and across America. So thank you so much um, for that. And I'm really happy that we have this resolution uh, that we have presented. Now we are up for our presentation from Madrone High School. Uh, and we look forward to hearing from Principal Victoria Martin. Good evening. Always a little nervous. I don't know how many times I do anything like this. Don't but, be nervous. Uh, we're, we're friendly. You guys are very friendly. We won't, ask very hard, <laughs> we won't ask hard questions. Good. All right. So um, let's try this. Okay. No. All right. So my name is Victoria Martin. This is my first year as principal of Madrone High School. I spent the last 10 years as a special education teacher and then an assistant principal in the East Bay, uh, both at the middle and high school level. Uh, my wife and I got married last October, and we moved to San Rafael with our two cats the next month. <laughs> and because I wasn't busy enough, uh, we got a puppy right there, uh, which has been quite a fun journey in my first year as principal as well. Uh, so when I'm not walking the dog or at work, I, uh, I like to play golf. Yes. And I'm a big sports fan, but it's a very oppositional uh, relationship in my front office. I'm a big Dodger fan. Um, and everybody hates me for six to eight months out of the year. That's right. So it's not yet, yeah, not just a drone everywhere. Um, and so that is me with uh, some of my staff. Uh, I went to that game that night, that was game five, when the Dodgers uh, beat the Giants in an amazing call. Um, Let's keep moving. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I enjoy uh, being a school administrator because kids are very interesting and they're fascinating. Uh, it's never boring. And it's just really fun to watch how teenagers especially navigate the world and, and interact with each other and with me. And uh, I, I, it's very, it's almost an honor to like get to see kids grow up. And uh, I really like high school because normally you see them from ninth grade and you're like, oh my God. And then it's here, you're like, look at this like perfect little baby angel who's going out in the world to do really amazing things. So uh, I like to watch that growth. Uh, next slide. A little more about Madrone, just the, the numbers game. Uh, Madrone is 11th to 12th graders, 16 or over, who were either chose to, to come to Madrone um, because they thought it was a good fit or just based on credit alone needed to come to us. So we're 96% Latinx. Most of my parents speak Spanish. Uh, we have a high population of ELs, either reclassified or long-term English language learners. And this year in particular, this number is really high. We normally don't have 16% of our students have IEPs, but this year we do. And you're going to see a high correlation. Whenever you see a lot of students with IEPs, you're going to see a lot of LTELs because a lot of times those students don't reclassify. So that's a number that kind of goes hand in hand a lot of the time. And 80% uh, of our students are on free and reduced lunch. That is just the, the numbers game. But I think that the drone is much more than that. Uh, our school is a place full of amazing teachers and staff that really look at it as a place of community. Uh, this year, we looked at our youth, troops, youth truth survey results, and uh, we always just want to gauge effectiveness in working with kids. 70% of our students reported feeling uh, a sense of belonging on campus and reported receiving special attention, uh, positive special attention from me or for their teachers. Uh, and most important, importantly to me, 79% uh, of our kids reported that they felt like teachers didn't let them give up when the work got hard. Uh, I think that's the biggest thing for our students. A lot of our kids are just really good kids, but they're disengaged and they haven't had a lot of, um, they don't have a lot of academic resilience. And so it's really important to me that our teachers do not let them give up. You can do this. We're going to do it um, and push them through really difficult situations. This should be at 100%, right? But I think we're at a start coming in year one. This is a good start. Um, and for me, my own focus this year has been on working with students to become critical thinkers who have opinions and ideas about the world around them, but can also articulate those views and can advocate for themselves and their communities. That's very important that kids leave a drum with that skill. So I'm going to go kind of into our goals. 
the goals, uh, and I'll go more in depth in each of these goals, but the district values um, of community equity and joy, I think are things you should see every single day of the drone. I think I was, uh, I was hired because I'm kind of a joyful person, right? I think I bring a lot of fun to the room, but at the same time, uh, I believe that I was hired because I was going to do the systems work um, to improve the school. I believe in building community and I believe in having really hard conversations around equity and um, giving our students the voice to have those conversations in their own homes and in their own community as well. We've had a lot of joy this year. I can say that. I think I feel that way. But we've also improved um, systems. We've worked, worked on building capacity and engaging students, and we've worked on increasing student voice. Um, this work is being done on a smaller scale. Sorry, I, that was my fault. I'll go back one. What's on the page turning indicates a slide turn, but not for me. Uh, and we've done a lot of work on the bridge program. It's it's a smaller scale, and these are, are very different. But we've worked really hard on exposing students to uh, language development and social emotional services and just help them acclimate to the, their, their community and, and being, you know, first time in this country, be able to access school and be able to navigate the world around them. So next slide. From a systems perspective, I've worked to make the process of uh, transfer to Madrone more clear, not just for families, but for the comprehensive sites. I think in some ways Madrone's been a little bit of mystery. And I think when you're a mystery, you're undervalued and you are also not, um, you're misunderstood. And that's, that's a big issue for me. So oftentimes kids feel like getting sent to us as a punishment. If you ask any kid with us, they love it, right? Like I have like a hundred, about like a thousand on kids liking school at Madrone, but they have to get there first. And if they don't know what we do and how we do it, it's really going to be a struggle to, to make people want to come there. Um, I think with all the families before the first day of school for every kid individually, we have a two day orientation to start the year. We have a half day orientation halfway through the year for new kids coming in. And I'm also just really having honest conversations with families about what they think about Madrone. I ask them directly, what do you know about Madrone? And oftentimes it's not great, but it's oftentimes incorrect, right? And so my job is to give them the facts about what we do and who we are and make them feel very, very welcome. And then even if they don't come to us, they go out in the community and they spread the word that we're actually an amazing place that can do really good things for them. So that's been a really big goal. It's just having like good conversations with families, even if they don't want to come, they leave being like, oh yeah, like that place is really great and it's doing good stuff. Uh, and lastly, I'm working with the counseling team at the Conference of High Schools to make sure that we're using data early and often to decide um, who should be contacted about the great things we can do for them. Uh, oftentimes if we wait, then it's just the kids that like are red flags on our radar, like, oh my gosh, we need to give them something. There's plenty of kids that could use Madrone that aren't there yet. And we have to use data to be able to figure out who those kids are and contact them. Next slide. I'm very proud of my staff's willingness to try anything. Uh, I've had a lot of good ideas this year and I've had a lot of okay ideas and they keep coming back and letting me try new things. So uh, I really appreciate their work on that and their flexibility with me. Uh, we've done some cool stuff this year. We have a three week uh, wide PBL showcase. We actually are doing this Friday. Uh, all of our teachers went through PBL training through the Buck Institute. We've really expanded our art and science curriculum to bring really hands-on uh, project-based uh, learning for those classrooms. So the kids are more engaged in the work uh, we've expanded our library for independent reading so that students actually relate to the text. So we ask them to do additional work. They're more likely to jump in and say, yeah, I, I actually like that book. I want to read it. So Ms. Morgan's done great work on that. Um, and Mr. Uh, Corn and Ms. Cummins have done great work with art and science. And then Ms. Cummins has also done a really good job. Uh, I don't know how she did it, but she's really good. We have an art curriculum that actually allows students to pursue the art medium they want to do for really large chunks of time. So a lot of time you get kids in art class and like, oh, I don't want to do this, right? They want to do that. And they're waiting for that moment to like do what they like. And she's done a really good job of getting them in early on things they actually enjoy so they can kind of get rolling and get engaged. Um, I want Madrone to feel like a place that was meant for each individual kid. Uh, I don't want to feel like a place they ended up. And, and I think it's really important that they feel like we're serving them as individuals. So that's a lot of the engagement work. This year has been around meeting each kid individually with, with where they are. Um, and the last thing we've done is uh, trauma-informed and mindfulness practices for the staff. And I brought in um, some training for staff and for uh, students around the science of trauma and how it impacts students of color. I think that that's like, we talk about trauma, but we don't actually talk about what actually happens in the brain for kids and what the results are. So that's been really successful in kind of opening up people's minds to um, not just terms, but like, what does it actually look like with, with, you know, with a kid in your face, right? Next slide. I stand by the belief that if you don't make school fun, kids will make it fun for themselves most of the time at your expense. So uh, I've tried to make school as fun as possible this year. We have a lot of events that celebrate culture. We have a lot of events that celebrate community. Uh, we had a back to school night that involved in-person and in-person barbecue with like batting cages and miniature golf. Um, we have parents bringing in really amazing food for our events. We try to um, celebrate student culture. 
um, during Hispanic Heritage Month, but also like during the holidays. There's very specific cultural pieces that happen over you know Christmas that are very different in very different cultures. We want kids to feel welcome and feel like this is their school. And so I've really worked hard to try to make um, that be something that we do more frequently. I also um, hired a community liaison for Madrone with 90, you know, I think it's almost 95% Spanish speaking families. Like I have to get those families on speed dial. Kids act very differently when they know that you talk to their parents. And I think we've, we've lost that idea at Madrone. We've thought, well, those parents are disengaged and they're not disengaged. They're just not informed because they can't access school in the same way. And you see that same result for their kids. So the, the parents of Madrone, they want to be involved. I've never had a negative phone call. I've never had somebody they probably give me too much freedom with how to discipline their kids, right? But um, I really, they've been awesome in every single engagement. And I want them to feel welcome and I want them to know that we're there for them. So Ms. Clefani has been, I can't even explain how beneficial she's been to us as far as opening that door for parents um, on our site. And finally, um, our students have pretty strong opinions around issues of, of race and how it affects them. Uh, but unfortunately, I don't think really, they really have the language to kind of talk about it. And they, they know when something isn't right, but they don't know how to explain that it isn't right in a way that will make change. And so my hope is to use conversations around race and equity to create more critical thinkers and better communicators and advocates for, for their families and themselves and their community. We brought in um, Dr. Lori Watson for conversations around race with students. We brought in Professor Lara from uh, San Francisco City College and a couple other areas. He's an ethnic studies professor who went through the continuation model. Right, so he has a very, very hands-on experience with what that looks like, and he's been invaluable um, as far as giving our kids a, kind of showing them someone who can be really successful. Um, my responsibility is making sure they can recognize things that affect them in a negative way, and they can articulate ways to make changes um, for themselves. So that's been a big push for me this year. And the last, almost last slide, uh, improve bridge. Those kids are probably the, my favorite kids I've ever worked with. Um, the fact that those students have come here under, under duress most of the time, have traveled with other families, and they come to school and they ask questions about learning, which is not credits, not grades. They want to know how they're going to learn. And it's almost like a culture shock, right, for me in, in the American educational system to have students so obsessed with, like, the content. But it's pretty impressive. Um, and my goal has just been to improve Bridge for them, uh, improve the systems that exist, uh, make it fit more of their individual needs, and also to um, add social and emotional supports that they really, really, really need, and just um, how to navigate the world around them because they just don't, they're just brand new to this place and we're asking a lot of them. So I think launching Bridge during a pandemic and during distance learning was difficult. And I think my job is to come in and try to find ways to really support these kids and, and to improve the system. And uh, San Rafael has been invaluable with that, helping me um, in, as far as master schedule planning and things like that. And um, finally, my counselor, Ms. Mazariegos, and uh, Ms. Stefani have just been like beyond helpful for helping these kids feel welcome and, and taking care of in school. So that is the general overview of what I've been doing for six, I don't know, eight months. Oh, <laughs> what is it? Um, but I'm definitely interested in questions. Okay, well, thank you so much, and congratulations to your family, your growing family with your puppy. And I'll just see if we have any questions from our trustees. Student trustees and trustees on the board here. Uh, Trustee Palma. Uh, yeah. uh, thank you for um, this great presentation. Keep us up to date on what's going on at, at Madron. Um, I agree with you. Uh, the community doesn't really know what Madron is all about exactly because it has a bad reputation from the past. Um, I noticed that uh, in your presentation, is one of the goals is to improve the bridge program. What do you really mean by that? I mean that the just because a student is an unaccompanied minor does not mean they fit a specific academic profile. Um, and I think when you have a moving target of the number of students coming in at a given, at a given time, it's really you have to be really thoughtful in how you plan curriculum and instruction so that when a kid shows up in uh, August. And when a kid shows up in February, they get as much the same academic experience um, no matter when they arrive. And so that's, I guess, the, the part where it's, it's a challenge, right? Because, um, you know, when you double in size in any given year, it's, it's, you have to be really thoughtful in your planning for that. And so that's kind of been my goal is how do we really think about curriculum in a way that serves students? You have some students who have to finish the fourth grade. You have some students who finished some high school, right? And they probably shouldn't be in the same classroom for the first with the ELD, yeah. right? And we need to be really thoughtful about that. And it's, it's a moving target and it's, it's, it's a challenge, you know, um, but it's also a blessing. These kids are, are probably our most well-behaved, 
most or kind of students that we have. And so we're, we're lucky to have them on campus and it's how do we serve them. Um, I really, I really like that goal. The other goal that I really, I'm impressed with is uh, to prepare kids after high school. So uh, meaning, meaning I guess that they don't necessarily have to graduate from a, a university, meaning they don't have to comply with A to G, but they can choose whatever career they want to pursue, right? Is that, is that the minute? Yeah, so A to G, right. But most of our kids go to COM. And so we bring COM in and have a lot of discussions around what they can do. But in reality, it's a lot of like, walking a kid through the actual process. So my counselor hand walks, like hand holds and walks a kid through, how do you enroll? When is your, how do you select your classes, this kind of stuff? Because it's not that they don't wanna go, but they just haven't had a lot of like really good school experience. And I think going again is like, oh, like I just got through this, right? And so you really have to like give it, like give them the, the, the red carpet treatment to get them to move forward. So that's been the biggest thing for us is bringing other programs in like, um, there's different fire programs they can do. There's different stuff they can do at Calm. There's different stuff they can do with the community. Presenting all those options and then making sure before they walk out the door at the end of the year, they've signed up for something and they're going to go. That's been our biggest. Uh, that is biggest awesome. Yeah. My last question, I'm sorry, oh, okay. is that uh, you mentioned parent engagement. How do you meet that? I think that it is tough because a lot of these parents, in my opinion, in my experience, I guess in year one, they really care, but they haven't always, and I don't think it's anybody's fault, but they, they haven't always felt like they can just walk into campus and ask a question because oftentimes they can't, right? So exactly. I think by making sure that like Ms. Kafani, she hates me because every day I'm like, call 15 people. And she's like, oh God, the list just keeps growing, right? But we, those parents need to know what's going on. And if we're calling them and we're informing them on a weekly basis or a monthly basis about what's going on with their kids, when they have a problem or they have a question, they're more likely to call back. And I think that's, um, we haven't had them in the door because we weren't supposed to for a while. But as things start to open up, like I want parents in the room and seeing what we're doing. So you're the one reaching out. <laughs> yeah, I'll blow them up. Oh, that's, that's why, great. That's why I hired them for like, yes, yeah, yeah. to get after them because I want them to know that I want to know what their kids are doing. And I want to like be that bridge for, to make sure that we can get them out of here on time. Thank you so much. Yeah. Doing great. Questions? Yes, no, thank you, um, Victoria. This has been great. And I, I mean, in eight months, you have done so much. <laughs> it's really impressive. Um, so I know that you put some statistic there and, and you know, follow up on some of um, Trustee Palma's questions, but, you know, the fact that uh, so I think the students have a different profile in terms of other Latino students in, in, in the district, like a lot of them are recently immigrated students, you just mentioned on a company minors, right? So a lot of them are children who just arrived to the country Recently, so do you have any data understanding like people, how many of these students that are in Madrona are actually children or students that went through our system versus how many children that are in Madrona are actually students that recently emigrated yeah. and came to that So, so Bridge is separate, a separate count. Um, those students are obviously all unaccompanied minors who just mm -hmm. got here. That's yeah. what you need to be to, if you don't qualify for AB 2121, then, you, then you're not qualifying for Bridge, right? But um, I would say that most of my kids um, went to Villa Vista, went to Coleman, mm -hmm. went to San Pedro, um, and, and most of our kids are, are in district kids. Mm -hmm. So how many are in the bridge program with versus how many are in the other program? So at any given time um, in Madrone, we do early exit. So if kids get through mm -hmm. on a normal year, we're like 65 to 75. This year, because AB 104, we had a reduction in the number of students that came, right? Mm -hmm. But I would say at any time this year, we've had about almost 50, right? And then um, bridge mm -hmm. is at 102 right now. Yeah. yeah. Sounds like it. Yeah, so this is the, uh, this is part of the things that, and I, before even you joined our district, like one of my job and my other day job was to represent on a company minors. Like that has been some part of my job. So I've been raising the alarms for a while <laughs> around this issue that you have children, you cannot really predict how many in a given year are going to come into the district. So my sympathy to you, because this is a very difficult issue around bridge and how do you fund this program? Because you don't know in a given year what the immigration trends are going to be. So it's incredibly problematic. But the other issue that I want to ask you is like, do you find also that sometimes it's not just the parent engagement, but they're also students who potentially are don't have parents in the United States, especially in the bridge program where they have a guardian who can be an aunt, an uncle, a sibling. And that also can be a very difficult situation because you're not just talking about necessarily the parent, but there's also another family member who's potentially the guardian for, for the students. I would, I would say that I, I get better parent engagement from the unaccompanied minors um, 
whoever their their guardian is mm -hmm. than I do um, parents of that have gone through the system here. Mm -hmm. So I don't. There's a bridge. The bridge level. There's not much of an issue with um, if I call. I think there's also some concerns about immigration status and things like that. There's a very very they're very responsive, right? Yeah. But um, but I would say that our parent engagement is actually better in um, bridge and is a drum, which we have to work on. And one last question, what do you do with any of those students that are, you're saying some students might have not finished fourth grade, but then you also have students who potentially have some high school. Like how do you, how, how is this district, you know, necessarily doing with this on a day-to-day -day basis? So I believe that we've done a really good job of pairing um, our EL, like the classes that they're in, and we're doubling up on EL, um, ELD classes, right? So they we can figure out what language level they're actually at, what they've done. But um, it's, it's tough. And I think that the, the teachers are really good at mm -hmm. um, bringing the curriculum to a level they can access when they first get there. And that is language progresses mm -hmm. upping the, the game a little bit as far as what we're asking of them. But it is very, very challenging. I, I mean, and I think that, um, and when you look at, you know, curriculum isn't, I can't just go buy curriculum, right? They don't have it, right? Yeah. So it's, it's been a lot of work, but I think I have a really, really, really strong staff. And I have never been told no uh, this year on any supports and services I need for these kids. It's just the moving target piece. Like I'm a master schedule builder, right? Like I look at that and I'm like, oh my God, like how do you do that, right? Like yeah. how do you to match union contracts and FTE to a yeah. moving enrollment, right? Yeah. But we get it done and the kids, they, I think they feel supported and I think they feel like they're welcome on our campus. Um, not because of me, because of my liaison who's amazing and for a counselor, but, but we'll take it, right? Yeah. Um, but it is very, very challenging. Thank you so much, Principal Martin. Yes. I bet some of, part of the reason why they feel so welcome is because you have such a great attitude and, and, and how joyful you are and the energy and the effort you really are putting into the students because it does show that you really care. So I think part of the success of what we're doing is because of your own um, ability to connect with the, with the community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Marquis. Yes, I was just going to say, Victoria, thank you so much. I drive by the drone on my way home every day, and I'm always like, what is happening in there? So thank you so much. I have eight-year-olds, and we're always looking at the high school. Um, and I just want to really be thankful for your thoughtful presentation of thinking of like a meaningful, holistic approach to students. That's so exciting. And as we know, COVID has really separated kind of parent engagement. I mean, it was already there, and now with COVID, it's even so for you to really focus and double down on that. Just thank you so much for doing that. And I really appreciated your presentation. It was, it was great. Thank you. Thank you, so, Trustee. Yes. Gina's hand go up. <laughs> thank you so much. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice is getting worse as things go on. Um, thank you so much for being here, Victoria. This was a really inspiring presentation, and you definitely exude the community value of joy. Um, and what I love in the way that you framed Madrone is that it's really about making it a school of choice, not a punishment. Mm -hmm. We can't expect every single child to learn, every single student to learn the same way. Some people need more flexibility. They need more individual attention, just like the example you gave about art. Why are we forced, why would we force people to only do certain types of art when they really want to do photography? I mean, it's, it's, this is, um, what's so inspiring about the students in Madrone, and I really felt this at the graduation last year, is that the kids that go there might go in thinking, oh no, I'm, I, I'm here for a punishment, but they leave loving it and really feeling like they have the tools to, to be successful their whole life. So thank you for inspiring that culture and for supporting our, our kids in that way. I'll just, Talia, yes. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you so much for this presentation. And just in at Centerville High, I've just heard nothing but wonderful things about Madrone and your leadership. Um, and I also wanted to just put the question out there. It's OK if you don't have an answer right now. Um, but I know a lot of students kind of want to do some work about learning more about Madrone and making sure that it's represented positively in our community, because I think that sometimes kids don't know what it is and they might feel confused about it and both for students who are going into Madrone and just the you know, general population of, of students in our high schools um, is there you know if there's anything student leadership and, and students in general can do to really help share the amazing work that your your school is doing yeah we um had a really great presentation from your broadcasting team uh this year and I, i'm working with a couple of my kids to get like a video uh kind of talking about Madrone in their words but any partnership um mm -hmm. like co-branding we could do to, to support that would be helpful. I think, I think kids seeing kids they know talking about a place um, in, in a really positive way uh, is is helpful. Um, I had a kid the other day who was asked like, what do you know about Madrone? Like that was like a threat and he goes, I could just help people. And I was like, good answer, good answer. You, you know what I mean? But it was like, and he was getting away from that model of, 
you know, of, of a punishment. It's big. Yeah, thank you. Else. Well, I just want to thank you very much. You know, my brother went to Continuation High, and it was a lifesaver. And I've seen it over and over again at Madrone. You hear the stories at graduation that Gina talked about, and, and they're really miracle stories. I, I appreciate what you said about calm, because not everybody's going to be A through G to go to a UC but, or a CSU. But if they go to calm, they're going to make it they'll be able to do that. And so I saw that in my own family and I'll, I'm, mm -hmm. I know you'll see it in yours. And I will know you've, you, you have had some really fabulous principals before you. And if they could hear you speak, they would just be smiling from ear to ear to know mm -hmm. that you're continuing and building on all the work that they've done um, at the school. You're right. The reputation is, is uh, out there, but it, and students are afraid and then they come in and they love it to pieces. So um, would, would it be that way for all of us when mm -hmm. we're afraid of something? Um, mm -hmm. And I'll just note that, you know, I think we all, you've heard me before this, Ukrainian students, whoever comes in, I know that you stand ready to help them um, succeed from wherever they come. So I'm just very excited to have you here tonight. Thank you so much. And I look forward to visiting um, in the next week and I, or next month or so. Sophia. Oh, Sophia. Sorry. One thing I wanted to know is I know oh. you mentioned that a lot of your students are really passionate about, you know, like they have a lot of opinions on how to incorporate racial ethnic equity in the district. And now something, something we're doing with Student Voice is trying to not make the, all the schools in the district all separated, but actually make them together. And that's why we have the Super 10 Student Advisory Council and everything. So I guess in the next year, I won't be here, unfortunately, but I think it'd be great to incorporate mm -hmm. more with drone students in the efforts of Student mm -hmm. Voice in the district. Okay, and I, before you go, I think we have some public comments. So we'll see. We have a public comment. George, you can. Oh, okay. Wonderful. Yeah. So I'm an outside agitator who has a, an independent opinion about the great things that are happening at Drone. I've been there twice and met with the entire student body. I've also met with the extraordinarily talented principal. And I must say, I never leave Madrone without feeling inspired. It is awesome. They are. So motivated. And I've had really in-depth discussions with many of the students. And one of the things they keep saying is, you know, at my previous school, a lot of teachers didn't care, but that's not true at Madrone. And that is the heart of an educational process that works. And Madrone works. So we can, walk, we can look at Madrone and learn a great deal about how to do stuff in our other schools. I am so impressed with the extraordinary leadership of Victoria Martin. And I must say that Alex Cruz is a really powerful spokesperson for the students at Madrone. And I've done an informal evaluation of Victoria. Sociological. <laughs> and I've come up with a, it's a bit technical, but she is definitely a rock star. <laughs> thank you thank you so much and i just want to also you don't do it alone i know you have a whole team so if you could convey our thanks back to them um tomorrow we appreciate it and i hope you have a good rest of the evening thank you guys thank you so much thank you. next uh item is a presentation from Carolinda High School, but it's actually from the Wren School of Environmental Leadership. So please come forward and we're here for you. Whatever you like. Come on up. Come on up. You can use the podium if you like. You can, yeah. Just, just, it's a little shaky. So. Just give me when you want to advance the slide. Okay, perfect. Thanks so much. Well, uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Raymond Clintock. I've been at TL for six years now, and this is my first board presentation, so I'm excited <laughs> to be here, um, and this is a lovely. Oh, I'm Sarah Montessier, and I'm a junior at Terra Linda High School. So I've led the Marin School of Environmental Leadership for five years, and I am easily the fourth most qualified person to speak on it tonight, because we have three lovely Marin Cell students here with us who could do a far better job. So I'll, I'll, I'll take in their support as we go through. Um, so you can go into the next slide, please. So the Marin Cell, as I'll call it going forward, is a four-year program um, where students come in in a cohorted model um, of anywhere between 30 to 34 
students. Um, and what is really at the, the base of it is project-based learning in environmental stewardship and, and activism and leadership. Um, within that project-based learning, what we try to do is really tie the units that we learn, whether it be in a geography class or an APS history class or a government class, to things that impact students' everyday lives. So some examples up there are, are zero net energy homes and sustainable food cook-off. Two of my favorite projects uh, in the freshman year, zero net energy homes, as we're learning about energy and how the energy sector is one of the leading contributors to climate change, we have the students do all this research and then they build a model home that shows what zero net energy means. And what that means is that the home produces as much energy as it consumes, right? Uh, and of course, they go home and tell their parents that we need solar panels and Tesla power walls and all that stuff, and you know, try to get their parents on board. Um, and then the sustainable food cook-off, which actually is going to happen this week in our freshman class. And so, as we're learning again about food systems and you know the impacts of different agricultural techniques and, and, and food development on climate change. We take the kids to the farmer's market at the civic center and we can buy local, you know, healthy, sustainable foods. And back when we had the kitchen at TL before they set up the, the, the fire, <laughs> before my time, it wasn't, it wasn't me. Um, we would bring the food back and cook these dishes here at TL. We'd make the hall smell good and everyone would be coming <laughs> to see what we're doing. But now that we're on that kitchen, we, we go off campus. So we'll be going up to the Calm Indian Valley uh, campus to then cook these dishes. And with that, the students need to show the carbon footprint and the price per dish and all these different things. So really getting students engaged in the curriculum is what we um, are all about. 21st century schools. I want to say that we were the cool kids before you walk around and you see collaboration and, you know, creativity everywhere. You know, Marincel before my time really had these four C's as their bedrock. So collaboration, critical thinking, communication, and creativity. Um, and we have kids do self-assessments on these four C's. We have them do peer assessments in all of their projects they do. They get feedback on these and it's always positive base, but also giving each other some critical feedback to really help each other grow as learners and as individuals. Community facing projects. Um, so part of what sets us aside is we partner with a lot of people in the community, Calm, Canal Alliance, um, you know, all our local middle schools and elementary schools, uh, you know, Fire Safe from Marin, all these different entities that partner with us, not only for our lead projects, but in community events and volunteering. And we get to have these really cool pro projects like transportation in the canal. A group of students were meeting with Marin Transit, trying to decide on more equitable bus routes to you know access those kids in a better way. Um, and wildfire preparedness, as we know, you know the, the smoke-filled skies and everything, really teaching our community about what it means to be wildfire prepared. And lastly, student support. As you can imagine from the MSL students that you guys have seen, extremely high achieving students, but every student is different. They all come from different backgrounds, different learning modalities, and what we want to do is support all these different kinds of learners. So although they signed up to be in a project-based curriculum and a project-based program, we want to make sure that, you know, if you are, um, you know, you want to be a little bit more artsy or you like things a little bit more direct instruction or you like, you know, really small group collaboration or whole grass collab or whole group collab collaboration, we try to do all these different things to meet all the different kinds of learners. Um, next slide. Before we get to this, I just want to say that in these last few years, this is my fifth year as lead teacher of the program, I have never felt more supported, uh, especially in those tenants than under this uh, leadership of Superintendent Hogaboom. He's been in my class several times, Principal Dunlap. You know, it just makes it being a teacher in this program gives me the autonomy to try these cool projects and push the bubble, push the envelope a little bit um, of traditional learning. So thank you guys so much. Expectations each year, each year these are the little catchphrases that we have for each uh, year as we go through. Ninth grade is the world around us. 
Uh, if you guys, I'll, I'll, I'm going to plug an event for tomorrow and one of the students speaking, we call it bad news in McClintock because, you know, climate change is a lot of bad news. And so we just expose the kids to all of these different issues around them. But then we start to become a little bit more solution oriented as we make our way through. 10th grade community builders, our lead projects focus on policy. So we have kids working with the city of San Rafael. We have kids working uh, with all these different groups. A couple years ago, kids had an appointment with uh, the lieutenant governor all the way up in Sacramento, you know, for these really big projects that we've been working on. 11th grade, what Sarah's going to talk about in a second, is their in a, they, it's innovative solutions. They are part of their sustainable business classes, their engineering tech, and they're starting to create some real change around them. And then lastly, when they're big, bad 12th graders like Sophia, now they're going to make real world change around them. Uh, they're going to be in their senior internships, they're getting ready for college and they're just going to build on all of these cool opportunities that they've had for the program and really go out and make us all proud. So I'm going to give you guys just an overview of the program. I know that uh, the majority of our board is new. So for the ninth grade curriculum, I would say the ninth grade year is really what sets the program apart, although the remaining years are, are impactful as well. <laughs> But the, the students come into Marin and they take five classes within the program. And then they'll take anywhere from two to three that are in general TL population. So it's a cohorted model. They are the same 30 to 35 kids with each other in those classes every day. So they get really tight, tight with each other, tight with their teachers, and it's a community that you would want um, any of our kids to, to have. So the Marin courses are the Environmental Leadership Seminar. Um, which is a UCA through G class, and they also get college credit from College of Marine for it. Our students graduate TL with 14 college credits from all these additional classes that they take. Um, health and PE, English, World Geography, which will be World Geography slash Ethnic Studies next year, and Biology. And again, these are the same group of students in all these classes together. And what sets this apart is the ability for us teachers to work collaboratively and work on interdisciplinary projects. So myself as a geography teacher and Ms. Frack as a biology teacher, Dave Tao as an English teacher, we just worked on an interdisciplinary project, um, mini documentaries on where California will be without water. And they had to take parts of all of our classes, what they learned in geography, what they learned in English, you know, rhetorical appeals, they learned in biology, and they put it all together into this really cool final project where they've learned the same content theme in all these different classes. And then, like I said, um, what the program does, and you'll see in the next slide in a second, is it kind of tapers its way up. That allows for our students to take other electives, AP courses, math, language that they want as they go through the program. Yep, thank you. Yeah. The classes that really are impactful in the program are leadership and environmental design uh, projects within our seminar, seminar class. They're semester long, action-based, environmentally focused service projects. So for example, right now our freshmen, we are partnered with Fire Safe Marin, we are partnered with Marin Clean Energy, we're partnered with a local landscaping company and working with our garden up here at the top of TL. And so we're working with these community experts, you could say, to do projects and kind of give back to our local community in some way, while also reaffirming the content that we're learning in our classes. It's all environmentally focused, of course. They start with individual research. Like it's not, you know, you, oftentimes, I don't know about you guys, but you talk about project-based learning and they think we're coloring and, you know, doing confetti and stuff like that. But really what we're doing is these research-based projects that is informed in, in real academic rigor. Um, they have to propose their projects, they implement them, and then they go out and make this real change. And as I said, we involve community experts at every turn, um, meaningful and, measure, and measurable, meaningful and measurable results. And then they culminate in a formal presentation and you can go to the next slide if you could. And along the way with all these projects, what we're also building in is a public speaking skills with our students. And so these are freshmen. And if you wouldn't know, you know, it looks like a formal business presentation. They're up on the stage, semi-formal dress, big project in the background, and they're just speaking so well. The best um, 
compliments I ever get is when I go back to the middle schools after and talk with these teachers when we, when we go and recruit for the program is they say that they've run into the, their old students around. They just can't believe how much they've grown and matured and they'll come in and do activities and projects and they just can't believe how much they've progressed. So that's, you know, really great for me to see as a teacher. Next step. And just real quickly, just to give you guys an idea of how the program grows over the four years, freshman year was those five classes, like I said, and then it's going to be three classes their 10th grade, three classes their 11th grade, and then really two classes their senior year. Um, and again, the whole purpose of that is to maintain, you know, the integrity of the program, uh, but also allow for students to have some, uh, be able to take what classes they would like, what, what inspires them, and that can be different language or mass or different electives, whatever it might be. Every year there's a seminar course. As I said, there's a lead, there's a, a, a lead project seminar course in 10th grade. In 11th grade, which there's gonna talk about in a second is our sustainable business course. And then their 12th grade is gonna be their internship. Next slide. And real quickly, the premise of the sustainable business course is the triple bottom line really fancy, you know, business slang for these businesses need to be sustainable. So they need to be, you know, good for the environment. We don't want them making a bunch of plastic or pollution or anything like that. They need to be profitable because of course it's a business, but they also need to be equitable. So they need to have a community component where they are bringing in members of the community and helping, uh, you know, less advantaged people in society, so on and so forth. And to talk more about this, we have Sarah to talk about her business and a little bit of her experience in the program. Yeah, so hello, my name is Sarah Mondesir, and this year I'm focusing on creating a business called Flavor Profiles. Um, something that really led me to this point was Marincel giving me this opportunity to really get out of my comfort zone and to really push for, to advocate for things that I'm really passionate about. I know during my freshman year of high school, I was really introverted. I was shy. I wouldn't really even speak up in class because I would just get really nervous, especially coming in from a different school compared to all these other kids. But as the year goes on, you know your classmates a lot more better. And through that, you also learn how to become a little bit more independent, open-minded, and a lot more creative. And so like this year, um, I was basically able to um, exercise everything that I have learned these past few years. And so basically, um, I am creating a business called Flavor Profiles. And what that is, is a storytelling cookbook that's made to honor and celebrate the lives of Black women who have passed due to police brutality. So what really gave me this idea was realizing how much of like last year and the pandemic has really impacted me and the community. And I've just noticed, especially as a black student, how I've just been treated and how like different women and black men have been treated in our society. And I really wanted to acknowledge that. And also I wanted to do com something completely different compared to all the other businesses. And so I was like, let's let's make a book. And I don't know if that was the best idea because like I, it's such a long process, but it's something that really allowed me to step out of my comfort zone and try something new. And so with that, I was able to actually meet, um, interview Brianna Taylor's mom. And so in that you're, if you purchase the cookbook and I have like the QR code, if you want to um, scan it with your phone and check out our website to pre-order it, but you'll learn what it's like to be a mother who has lost a daughter due to police brutality. And you'll also learn more about Brianna Taylor herself. And then in the book, you'll, you'll see um, five different women that have passed. And so what I'm trying to do is shine light as to who they were before they passed. Because um, something that I've really noticed is that when you search up the name Breonna Taylor, Sandra Bland, um, Atatiana Jefferson, like you see what has happened to them, but not who they were beforehand. And so I wanted to change that perspective because yes, they have died, but also I want to shine light as to who they were before. Like we are not just all victims. We are more than that. And that's something that I, I'm really trying to advocate. And I really want to shine light to show, especially other kids in our community who may identify as Black, Latino, or any other race that you are more than what society paints you to be. And I know because I was filled with so much news, like about like a new black person dying every single day that really like 
diminish my spirits and my enthusiasm about life itself. And so I wanted to change that. And I want people to understand that, like, we don't always have to have like a bad ending to our life. There is a lot of things that we can do before then. And there is stuff that we can do um, like right now. And so I really want to highlight the fact that life is a gift, whether we think so or not, like it really is. And so you really should live it to the fullest. And so um, that's where my storytelling cookbook um, comes in. And so I'm just gonna go around and pass uh, out like a few papers. So if you're interested, yeah. you can definitely pre-order it. <laughs> so yeah, thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah's story made uh, the magazine Good, good, I'll be there as well. Which is up on the board. So she got published, her story, her business. Uh, and as I said, these kids do, as you can tell, they grow so much and they could do all these presentations themselves. They just grow. Uh, phenomenal. Thank you, Sarah. I'm going to plug her business here in a second. Yeah. You, know, you already did that. You know that. <laughs> well, we're going to do it more. Than that. Um, more than that. So after their junior year, as you can tell, these awesome businesses that they create, uh, they get into their senior internships, and we it's we have so many different partnerships around the community, anywhere from the organic farm up at Calm. We have Friends of China Camp. We have Marin County Office of Ed. We have students that have worked for Office of Supervisor Connolly. We have the San Rafael Airport, Marine Clean Energy. You know, really community ingrained um, nonprofits and businesses that support our students in their next semi professional step out there into adulthood. Next step. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank I, when I go and talk to middle schools, I tell them that Marin Cell is not about getting to college, but it is a lovely side effect, right? <laughs> and so here are just a couple of the universities that our students get into. And I like to boast about it. Students are much more, you know, reserved, but I'm just so proud of the work that they did to get to these universities not about just getting accepted into them but they've done so much work and to see their hard work be realized to see their dreams come true is just phenomenal our current MSL class coming from Ron Sophia was it six got accepted to Cal five or six eight was it okay <laughs> one class yeah. um, wow. <laughs> Uh, in one class, and this is a smaller class, there's only 20, uh, 24 students in our current senior class, so a huge proportion of students get accepted to top universities, and again, it's, it's not about that, but it is a great highlight and a great way to cap off uh, the hard work for four years. Next. So... If you guys are all excited about this program, which I know you're chomping up a bit, tomorrow in the TL Hub Courtyard, right up here, we're going to have our Green Business Leaders event. And so this is where Sarah and all of her peers in our junior class are going to highlight and showcase their businesses. It's going to be from 5 to 7 p.m. Um, and it's going to be um, a little bit of going around and seeing their businesses to also coming in and hearing to student speakers and a keynote, going back out, looking at uh, their businesses, you know, some appetizers, you know, it's a really great community uh, involved activity. We get a lot of people out to it each year. It's super fun. It's Miss Dunlap's favorite event. She gets to go around and buy all these cool, uh, you know, business uh, businesses that these students have. So if you're interested in Sarah's cookbook, uh, we also have, what are some of the other businesses? We have candles, lip balms. So, and also we have bird houses. Too. And bird houses. So all different kinds of young entrepreneurial uh, things. That you, yeah, that you guys can come see. So please come on out and see us. And I think Stone Lab's gonna come up and talk about uh, growing diversity in the program. Great. Thank you, Ray, and thank you, Sarah. And it's so nice. We have four Rensel, or three Rensel students here tonight with Sophia Chess. So any program like Rensel is, you know, it's, we can't have it be people dependent. It's, it has to be sustainable. And so our two big things that we focused on have been diversity and sustainability of the program. 
So 12 years ago, when we started this program, it really began by a parent partnership and parents were going to start their own uh, private school and, you know, kind of a charter school, or they were going to send their kids to some of the private schools nearby us. And uh, the principal at the time said, let's start something within the school. Um, what, um, while that is great, that comes with a cost. And the cost was significant. We've been asking parents uh, for $5,000 a year to contribute to pay for uh, the program expenses. And my goal uh, has been since the very beginning as assistant principal involved in the program uh, to principal has been trying to see how we can do two things really. Number one, um, make the program sustainable so we don't have to ask for a cost and a, a contribution. That's, that's a donation. But I still say, you know, it's, it's disingenuous to say it's a donation. There's, there's always going to be a pressure to contribute. Um, and then with that, again, is also growing the school's diversity so that it really uh, mirrors who Tara Linda is. And Tara Linda is a diverse school. Um, so under Superintendent Hogeboom's leadership, we've really improved our outreach. Uh, to our feeder schools. That has been the first thing is partnering with Benish Valley and Davidson. And our, our principals have been totally on board. Um, that's the great part. The harder part is really attracting, bringing the kids in and making them know that they will be comfortable and accepted within our program. So you can see we had in 2021-22 a spike in our um, diversity. 22, 23 was really, really challenging because we were totally remote and it was very hard to do a lot of the um, outreach during the time of, you know, in between there and really the beginning of the year, um, going back out to the campuses and um, doing a good job around recruiting. Um, so we've made that a commitment for this next year. Again, every year you're bringing in a class of anywhere between 30 and 35 students. Mm -hmm. So to really look at the diversity of that group that you're bringing in, our goal really needs to be around 40, 45% of the students um, being not only um, racially diverse, but also socioeconomically diverse. If we can go into the next slide here, um, two of the things uh, we've done uh, also include uh, bringing Lori Watson in and doing um, in addition to the culturally responsive um, teaching for PD that all of our teachers do, doing something in particular with our Marin Cell uh, teachers and students. And we are committed to increasing diversity with the big thing here being this next line, eventually eliminating all fundraising and having all costs absorbed within the SRCS and TL site budgets. Um, so this next slide, I'll kind of tell you what that looks like, but a perfect example would be the courses that Ray talked about, those environmental leadership classes are a part of every single year. And if you think of a teacher teaches five classes, so one class they teach is, we, we say one FTE, uh, 0.2 FTE is around $20,000. So by having one class that's dedicated to Marincel students as a elective each year, you're looking at a $20,000 expenditure each year. So what we've tried to do is say, how can we eliminate that cost? And what we've done is we've partnered with College of Marin so that they are providing an instructor for that class. We've gone away where two of the classes are now absorbed and taught within College of Marin. So we're only left to freshman and sophomore. We began with senior, then junior, and then we're kind of chipping away so that that gets absorbed. The next thing we're doing is something like the leadership cost. Right now, there's a $50,000 fellow that is um, a cost shared by um, SEI, the company that supports us through Cyan Dandridge and the school district. And what we're doing is moving away from that model and instead having all of the leadership costs housed within the school. Ray's tremendous. You, you can tell in just meeting him for 15 minutes here, we need to have more Ray and build that cost in. So what we've done is we've doubled the amount of time we have with Ray. Again, one section is $20,000. So we've increased that, have two sections of Ray, and then instead move away from that $50,000 uh, additional cost that's all fundraising dollars. Teacher stipends, 
There's additional things that our teachers go to. For example, they go to the all, tomorrow's business event and a, a number of night events, different things. We want to build those costs into our site budget. And then also curriculum development, release time, sub time, all of that. So by transitioning these costs into our operating budget, we're able to reduce the amount of fundraising. It once was over $160,000 a year. We're way down there to where we are, you know, around that $60,000 mark. And I know within the next two years, my goal is to go completely to where we're not asking for a dollar of donation. And we're, um, you know, very much like Abbott, able to uh, pay for the program with its so. own. And that, I, I believe, is, is the key to diversity in the program, you know, in, in, in the end, kind of getting us over that glass hurdle. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much, and um, thank you for supporting the program, and yeah. ready for presenting. Thank you so much. And if any of you guys would ever like to come in and see, we love having <laughs> visitors. I tell Jim to come in all the time. Uh, so come on in, and if you want to see any school projects, then you're, you're always more welcome. Let's see if our student trustee, uh, Sophia Weinstein, mm -hmm. has anything to add to this or yeah. share. Yeah, I mean, similar to what Sarah mentioned, I mean, I came in as a freshman in high school, incredibly shy. But I think the first thing is, I mean, like Sarah, I come from Miller Creek, which is where the majority of students in the Cell program are from. Um, so I think you start out in the program by really building tight connections with your classmates. And Marincel also has retreats a week before school actually starts. So that's a great way for community building and collaboration with your classmates. But not only that, I think that um, when you're looking at universities and, you know, you're on that path to college, your senior year, they're really looking for leaders right now. And so I think that's obviously one of the main things that the Marinsville program really challenges students to become as leaders through all these projects and the um, challenging students, their freshman, sophomore, junior, senior year. Um, and so the Marinsville program has obviously given me a lot. It's not just going to be ending now once I go off to college next year. I'll be using the skills that Prince Hall has given me in college and beyond once I'm out of college as well. So thank you. Okay. Yeah, can I add something to that? I joined the program. Well, I, I'm a sophomore, so I've been here two years. And I think a really fundamental part about the program is it really inspires a love of learning in the students. And I feel like in some classes, I'm with students who who are checking boxes, they're going through their school day checking boxes. But when I walk into a Marincel class, everyone wants to be there. They're truly interested in the project. They want to learn, they want to learn more. They're going above and beyond their teacher's expectation. So I do think it's a really important program. It's given me a lot. It's given all of my, my fellow classmates a lot. And yeah, I just want to thank Ray and everyone else for making it possible. Tess is going to solve nuclear fusion. Very good. See if anybody on our screen has any comment to add. Of Talia, please. Yeah, I just want to say, Sarah, hearing the the work that you're doing is just incredible, and we are. I, I would love to share it at Santa Fe High with our students. I think it would be so valuable for so many of our students. So Sophia is going to share the QR code with me, and I'm really hoping that a lot of us will. Um, engage in what you've created because this yeah you know, it's just really powerful and incredible to hear mm -hmm. any trustee um gina. questions mm -hmm. or comments i oh, will go off to gina okay gina yes please well thanks so much for the <clears throat> thanks so much for the presentation um i've been so impressed by all of the marin Sol students that i've met um and i've really enjoyed being part of some of the student presentations and actually providing feedback on some of the ideas that students have had um it's they're just, they're so innovative and smart. And, you know, climate change is really the moral issue of our time. And so to be teaching um, all of these subjects with a focus on environment and climate and prepare these students to be out there in the world fighting for a brighter future for everyone is really inspiring. And I also hope that Sophia will share the QR code with me um, so I can take a look at the book as well. But congratulations. It sounds like an amazing project and what a wonderful way to honor um, the story of all those women. So thank you for that. And here at the board, 
No? Oh, okay. So thank so, you. Yeah, thank you so much for, yeah, for being you. here. Um, the, I just, well, first of all, congratulations. It's been an amazing presentation. I actually was not familiar with this program. So this has been incredibly informative. So thank you so much. Um, one thing I wanted to highlight and, and you know, to Sarah in, in her presentation is, you know, as I cannot imagine right now where it is to be young in this generation, going to school, and at the same time to worry about climate change, what it does to your mental health, and not knowing exactly what the future is going to look like. And on top of that, also have to deal with things around police brutality and racism. So I, I am, I'm interested in, in hearing from you, like, how do you keep a, a program like this? Like, how you keep yourself um, above the the trauma and above the, the doom that we have or we think we have ahead of us and, and how do we can make our school better and how, in your opinion, we can actually even, you know, contribute to this program to not feel like all the negative effects, all the things that we're constantly seeing, um, it really brings us down, but how we can bring some hope to the work that you're doing and the way you did it with the book is a beautiful example, but I would love to hear from you and I really want to tell you that I hope you also and all the students can really see some joy and positivity and 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 the, the things that are out there are not necessarily what you're gonna end up experiencing so I, I am very proud to see a student like you just stand up and, and and bringing this to to the board but I will really would love to hear from you Sarah like how do you keep your head above all of this yeah, so honestly, it's not really easy. I know, like when we were online, I really fell into this depression and into this cycle of like trying to figure out like my worth and also trying to figure out like how to balance school and everything. And something that has stayed consistent was the Marin Cell program because like even though there were times where I just wanted to like you know forget about school or not want to work on an assignment although there's like annoying reminders that we have a presentation or something <laughs> like that like it does force you to almost like keep, like stay on your toes to keep on pushing forward and honestly having the experience to, of like being able to like create your own business has really inspired me and I feel like what a lot of students need right now is like motivation and empowerment. And I feel as though because I'm really passionate about social justice and because I see different areas as to where we can better our campus and like the Marin Cell program, that really pushed me to want to do something completely out of the box. Like I am that the only black girl in my class. And so I really wanted to step out of my comfort zone and also allow students to take a look like into my life and my experiences. And I feel like the best way to do that is to be the first person to like stand up and to speak out about different issues. And so that's something that I definitely wanted to do. And I know um, for my internship, I'm going to be working on making sure that like we are bringing in more diverse spaces into the program mm -hmm. as well because this program is very beneficial to all students. And I want like every single student to like feel represented and seen and also to experience like the things that I'm experiencing. So. Thank you, Sarah, very inspirational. I appreciate wow. it. Thank yeah. you so much. I know we have one public comment, uh, I believe from George. <laughs> George. <laughs> you can unmute yourself sorry to keep interrupting your program here but uh i've been involved i've known about mcell for quite a while i've met with uh, cyan and and certainly with uh with ray i know a number of students have gone through the program it is an example of how when you engage students in an ex intrinsic way where they're actually motivated by understanding how their own society is affected by all these issues that we're facing it empowers them to do great work because it's real it's meaningful it has purpose in their lives but there's one thing i'm extremely concerned about eight students got into cal but oh. i didn't hear anything about stanford i'm calling the admissions <laughs> office. i'm calling the admissions office tomorrow and say hey yeah. <laughs> what's going on we got eight awesome young people into cal but where, what are you guys doing down there? What are you smoking? Knock it off. <laughs> so M cell rocks. And, and so I want to say it's an example of the extraordinary work that this district is doing to embrace all of the young people in our community 
to really move beyond the limits and push their own their own perceived self you know shortcomings and realize they're capable of extraordinary things and our school system is helping them transcend their limits in a very powerful way rock on san rafael city schools yeah. <laughs> okay we have another comment from i just want to quickly say that um adding on to what lucia was saying is that obviously we're in a world right now of constant change we see things on the news every other day about new war foreign conflict that's going on that obviously affects mental health of so many students um but one of the main things that they we do in the Marin Cell program is we have like community circles and class circles every once in a while, which Mr. McClintock mm -hmm. is maybe a little traumatized by. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, having him had, <laughs> having had him for, as a teacher for four years, he works so hard to make sure that every single student is supported. So he's truly there for every student for all four years, as well as Ms. Dunlap, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the community that Rincel has is truly remarkable. Well, thank you. So I do have a question for Principal Dunlap, and so I think um, you can, you'll be able to answer this, I, I, I believe, knowing your teacher so well. But first, I want to say, and it's about the transference of ideas from himself to Terrell High School and the high school um, teachers in, as a group. Um, but the other question, I was thrilled to see the enrollment of students of color go from 14% to 80 uh, Sorry. Eight students, 34%. 34%, thank you. My math teacher over here. Um, and, but, and then devastated to see what happens. So I can understand your disappointment too, because we've uh, asked about this every year, I think, when you present. And I look forward to seeing it going back up. It does take students of color showing up at the high school, middle schools and saying, you have a community here and you can make it work. And in a way, I have to think it's a great juxtaposition with the school that presented before you and the, if you will, the uncertainty that students might have beforehand and then the joy they find when they go to the, camp, uh, go to the school and find out that it's everything they dream. But could you talk a little bit about, because I know at the very beginning when this started up, some of the concept was the ideas would be tested and presented and run through Marinsal and that that would inform the um, comprehensive high school as well. So it, you don't have to run through the whole long list of everything, mm -hmm. but can you share some of the things that have transferred over that, that mm -hmm. you've learned or that teacher leaders have learned mm -hmm. from the program? I think probably more than anything would be the project-based learning and the PD that's kind of permeated, you know, across the campus from this. I mean, you take a teacher, you know, like, Ray or um, they just uh, one of the English teachers, uh, Dave, Dave, David Tao, he is teaching one class in Marin Cell, but he does the training with Marin Cell and he teaches for other classes. And you know, he'll be the first to say, hey, I get all these new strategies and ideas and mm -hmm. ways of teaching that now I implement in my all, all my classes, not just my run cell classes. I think the big thing that we see that's so, um, it's, it's a middle school strategy, is really teaming. And that's in the end what, and Cyan has been so, you know, she's been such a huge proponent of, I'm not going to change the idea of five classes in the beginning and keeping the kids having two to three classes together the rest of the time, how important it is of connections with adults. Sophia had Ray for four years, you know, and so that is something we've learned from. We see it with Avid, we try and replicate it. We try and replicate it with, you know, our EL classes, but for us to have from the project-based learning, the relationships, I mean, those are the real takeaways that we need to continue implementing across our school and in all programs. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that and look forward to hearing your presentation next year. I promise you, 23, it'll, 24. It'll, it'll go back up. We're all committed to it and we know that we're gonna do good outreach and continue to increase diversity and make our programs the same. Thank you so much. Sarah, thank you so much for coming and presenting. We look forward to seeing you yeah. tomorrow night. And to when, when's your book? Thank you. When's the book um, going to be done? So we're in the process of finalizing things and making edits. So maybe in two months, but hopefully less than that. But once you pre-order the book, we'll have all your information. And once it's ready, we'll send it over to you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
Okay, now we come to the point on the agenda when we share three words. What we've been up and doing the last uh, couple of weeks. So we'll start with the student, with the board trustees. And we'll see who would like to go first here at the table. Oh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Night. Um, Daly, uh, Jaina Daly, would you like to go first? Sure, I'll go first. Um, three things I wanna talk about. So the first is we had our parcel tax citizens oversight committee meeting um, last week. This is a really crucial part of passing a parcel tax is that we have an independent oversight authority that actually determines how to spend that funding and make sure is that, that it, it is in line with what voters approved. Um, and I wanna highlight that we're actually recruiting a couple members. So if anyone listening or knows the people that fall into these categories, please have them contact me or Emily Bush at the administration. Um, we're looking for a high school parent, an elementary, a middle school or elementary school parent, um, and also a senior citizen um, to be able to have that, uh, that viewpoint as well. Um, I also wanted to talk about the Heads Up Carnival is gonna be this Saturday from 11 to three at David, Davidson Middle School. There's gonna be fabulous food and games, um, everyone's so excited about having it in person again, and I really hope everyone can come out to support Heads Up because this is really the biggest fundraiser we do all year, and it supports so many important programs on our campus, on our campuses. Um, the last thing I'm going to mention is that um, we have received a number of emails from Coleman parents and teachers uh, concerning some uh, potential changes to the school in terms of staffing next year. And I just wanted to make sure that any parents or community members that are interested in learning more, there's gonna be a PTO meeting on May 2nd. And we encourage everyone to participate in that. I believe Superintendent Hogebim is gonna be there. And so hopefully this will be a time to get uh, some information about what's being proposed and um, answer any questions that parents and teachers might have. So that's it for me. Thank you. Um, Trustee Martin. Yes. Um, Gina took some of mine. I did yeah. get the opportunity to meet with uh, Micheline, the executive director from Heads Up. And just a reminder to attend the carnival. Who doesn't like a great cakewalk? Mm -hmm. I mean, let's just all do it. <laughs> um, so not only donate, but also volunteer. I know that she was looking for volunteers, whether you're parents or students. I also had the exciting opportunity to join Glenwood's community bocce ball tournament fundraiser this weekend. And as a parent and also building community back at our schools is super important because we haven't done events because of COVID. And um, I also attended a Marin foster care event to learn about the percentage of foster kids and youth in our schools and some of the high needs that um, we need to be thinking about for our foster youth in our communities. So yes, that's what I have. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Next. Yeah, I attended the DILAC meeting and uh, I really enjoyed it because this time it was interactive and uh, one of the goals is to find out about how the district could better serve the, our students and our parents. Uh, so the parents had the, they took the opportunity to let us know what was working and where we need improvement, what their needs are. Uh, we have a good list and uh, uh, they're really looking forward to continue having these conversations. I think we are in the right path to do what we're here to do, which is to serve our parents and students. Uh, with this said, uh, Voces del Canal is gonna have a, a, a forum at Picklewood on April 27th at 6 p.m. And it's gonna also gonna be with the goal for parents to express their um, opinions, questions, and concerns they might have so we can move forward. So looking forward to it. Thank you. Oh, and Jim Huggable will be present. <laughs> Cecilia Perez will be present. So we are happy to have you both. And Carolina, you're going to be able to make it? I will be there and I can't so wait. Show. Thank you. Um, I do not have any updates for the district, except okay. that I'm going to be traveling and not very engaged for now. <laughs> <laughs> So, but, and you have been in on the meetings with our superintendent. Yes, I definitely have a meeting so, with you and the superintendent. Okay. And so I thank you. Attended thank you. Yes, yeah. for reminding me of that. Yes. <laughs> the, uh, the parents council meeting I attended this last week, a couple of weeks ago. And also I'm on the San Rafael housing element work group. So I attended one of their five meetings that they're having this year and gave some feedback about constraints to housing. 
and meetings with our superintendent. So I also want to note, let me see here, I want to note that uh, uh, Marin Food Policy Council had a meeting and Alan Down Downing came from our food service staff and I think some of the staff came as well. Uh, and he did a great presentation to them about uh, policy barriers and opportunities for school nutrition. So it's, it's great to hear him speak. I'm really glad he made the time to be there. A lot of community leaders in the food advocacy world in Marin were there and they, were, they learned a lot about uh, the thousands of meals that he produces every day for our students. So it's very, very good. Convey my thanks. Your turn. Thank you. Well, this is such a busy time of year. There's something going on every single night. So um, you guys hit some of them. Uh, so Wednesday is Vosas Del Canal. Thursday is our Together 2024 community meeting at Santa Fe High at six o'clock. Uh, really excited about bringing that group back together again and getting some more input on some new strategies for that. Um, and then next Thursday, May 5th, uh, we're having a meeting with a Stanford professor, uh, so, George, we are including Stanford in that. She's an expert on homework and best practices. So, as you guys know, the Student Advisory Council has identified homework as our number one concern. Yes. That's right. So, students came up with concerns and suggestions. Then we met with our homework task force. The next step is to kind of hear, okay, so what are the most effective research-based strategies? So, on the 5th, that'll be a, a, a Zoom meeting. We'll do it in English and in Spanish. Um, and so, Denise will come and kind of share uh, what she, what her research has done. They did a big uh, study in 2010 and she's updated it. They have a white paper. So she'll kind of go over um, a lot of that, take a lot of questions, and then we'll move forward from there with some research-based best practices, hopefully. Yeah. Okay. And we'll hear from our student board members. Holly, you can go first. Yeah, so hello everybody. Um, our fourth quarter progress reports are due on Friday. So students are working to get all their last minute late work in. And that is on top of AP testing starting next week, um, which will go into the week after that. So just to note, students will not only be preparing for their exams, but also working to stay on top of classes they missed while testing, as well as any other kind of, we're starting to get our final projects and stuff as well. Um, and I just want to note that for a lot of our students, this is the first time they're taking AP tests in person. Um, so it's definitely a bit of a adjustment period for a lot of our students. And speaking of a lot of hard work, um, next week is National Teacher Appreciation Week. And we are so grateful for all of our teachers who have worked so incredibly hard during this pandemic and as we have come back to school. ASB is working to celebrate our teachers and we, as always, appreciate our PTO for doing the same. Um, just to highlight just one of the many wonderful things that teachers have done recently, they did win our staffer student April Madness game last week. Students did. We did ma manage to win our basketball game, our last game of the week, but staff won overall with victories in volleyball and soccer. Um, and it's really wonderful to be able to hold events like this again. Um, and I know the Heads Up Carnival has already been mentioned, and I'm hoping it, this will be the last time it is, unless, Sophia, you also want to do it. Um, but again, it's on Saturday, 11 to 3. There's been so much work put into this. Heads Up has always made it such an amazing event. And a lot of our students volunteer in a really wonderful way to support the community. Um, and then finally, I just want to say thank you again for all of the work that has been done to appoint a principal for Santa Fe High. We are super excited to get to know Mr. Dominguez, and we are so thrilled to welcome him to our community. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Sophia, Carolinda High School. Um, yeah, so this week at Carolinda, we have Spring Spirit Week, where today we all dress in a gray outfit. You might be wondering what that is. That's where you wear an all gray outfit. <laughs> I wore one earlier. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and we also have other planned spirit days, such as Adam Sandler Day, where you can dress any, um, you can dress as Adam Sandler in any of his movies. So that's another fun thing to do. Yeah. Feel so free funny. to join in on the fun. <laughs> um, this week, admin will also begin working with uh, departments as part of the master schedule matrix process to discuss important issues relating to scheduling. For next year, um, as Talia mentioned, progress grades will be due on April 29th, this Friday, um, and grades for this term are due and posted on ARIES by 10 p.m. on Tuesday, May 3rd. Um, again, Talia mentioned that AP testing will begin next week on Monday. There's mm -hmm. going to be two primary locations uh, for Terralinda. 
So the Sheraton at um, four points for the larger groups like AP Gov, AP Lit, AP Language and Composition. Um, and the smaller groups will just be here at Terlinda and some of the classrooms. Um, in addition, uh, summer assignments will be optional this year. They are recommended by teachers, but they're going to remain optional um, to kind of eliminate access barriers for honors and AP classes for all students. Um, something I will mention um, back to the AP classes, a, a small student concern is that um, some students have AP tests that are going to be back to back. And so they might finish testing around 12 p.m. And there's not a lot of communication about whether students are required to come back to school after AP testing. If you're testing at the Four Point Sheraton, I know a lot of students are not even planning on coming to school because from my own personal experience, taking a three and a half hour exam is really difficult and really draining. And I'm personally ready for a nap afterwards. <laughs> um, so not many students are going to be coming to school. But there's not really a lot of communication about whether we're required to go and we'll be marked absent. Um, Lastly, I'll just mention that Terrell received the honor of having Congressman Jerry Huffman this past Tuesday. Um, primarily juniors and seniors came to this event from their social sciences classes, and they just asked questions about current issues that um, Representative Huffman is working on in Congress right now. Um, thank you. Thank you, and thank you for raising the issues. That's exactly why you and Talia and the other student trustees are here, so you can keep us in. I know our superintendent, so I'm taking notes. So, um, And we'll see if we have any union reps who want to talk with us this evening. I'll look at Christina to see. Um, we do have Matt Wynn from SRFT. Okay. And um, we have not heard from CSEA. I've not seen anyone that I recognize that would potentially speak. Okay, so let's bring in Matt Whitten, teacher at San Rafael High School. Hey, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Hey, I'm Matt Winton. I'm a vice president of San Rafael Federation of Teachers and a history teacher at San Rafael High School. Thanks for having me. Um, also, thank you, Talia, for your kind words about teachers. I was actually going to speak on a similar subject. Um, I wanted to use my time to let you guys know that morale amongst many of our members is quite low. And we're, we've been working nonstop since the pandemic began more than two years ago. There's a lot of stress and fatigue amongst our teachers and counselors um, and students for that matter. And um, it's been pretty difficult. Um, you know, the best way to recognize educators has always been fair compensation for their labors, including when appropriate bonuses. Um, but there are other ways um, that are easier and not subject to the negotiating table, um, like taking um, some things off our plates, right? meetings or extra duties um, that are you know, on top of all of our extra work. We have members really scrambling to keep up with new district initiatives around grading, curriculum, and equity. And it, it would be great to streamline professional development and meeting time to ensure we're not all wearing too many hats. I know that's been in discussions and I just hope that going forward, especially for next year, we, we really focus on being really um, streamlined in that area. Um, also, please consider other ways to recognize our teachers. For instance, and I didn't know this, I went to the cafeteria for the first time on Friday and I had to buy lunch. Um, and it just would be a nice gesture, I think, if teachers could grab a school lunch. I can't imagine there are that many of us out there that would eat cafeteria food every day. So I don't think it would be a big cost. Um, another member of ours uh, suggested the district hire a coffee truck or a pastry truck and have our members and CSEA members go out and grab a coffee or pastry. Um, I've also heard that at TL there are vending machines for teachers. And no such thing exists at SR or Madrone, for that matter. <laughs> These kinds of gestures would go a long way, and they wouldn't hurt our budget too much. And they'd show our members um, how much um, you guys care. Anyway, that's my report. Thank you for your time, and I hope you all have a great rest of your evening. Thank you so much for your report. Yeah. Good to see you. Um, all right. Small is Molly, Molly, yes, Molly's here. Molly's here. Come forward. Yeah. Uh, good evening, trustees, staff, and community members. My name is Molly O'Donoghue, and I'm here this evening representing SRTA. 
As we planned our update tonight, we realized that despite the date being April 25th, we are actually in the 100 days of May, which means our members are preparing for CASP testing, supporting LPAC testing, doing one-on-one -on -one assessments with students, starting to write report cards and report card comments, anxious, anxiously waiting for 2022-23 teaching assignments, and thinking about class lists and student placements for next year. Preparing students for carnival singing performances, attending PTA, PTO, and together 2023 late night meetings, and continuing to facilitate joyful learning in our classrooms every single day. This time of year holds a lot for our members. As we resume a return to our pre-pandemic routines and demands, we ask that you continue to evaluate the workload and acknowledge that certain times of the year are a bit more chaotic, frantic, urgent, and demanding than others. Although we know that the end of the year is also a time for great joy and celebration, we have the 100 days of May to get through first. Thanks for your understanding, support, and thank you for supporting us through this time of year. Thank you so much. I you didn't mention open house and uh, back to uh, yep. and, uh, open house <laughs> graduation or promotions yes. at the end of the year. So, um, next item, uh, I do want to try to take a break around eight o'clock, but I think that'll be after the reclassification update. So, um, but uh, but first, we have public comment on items that are not on the agenda. I just wanted to give you a heads up, let you know you're going soon. Uh, Jason, you're just going to have to wait a little bit after the break. So, okay. But um, do we we have um, anybody who wants to speak on public comments? Um, so we'll let people know if they want to make a public comment yeah. to raise their hand. Yeah. And at this time, I'm seeing one from okay. George Pegalo. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> I, I do want to, Gina mentioned that. I, I know there is interest in um, uh, an item at Coleman School and that Superintendent Hogeboom mm -hmm. will be there for the PTO meeting, as Gina mentioned. And so I do appreciate if people want to wait till they actually have a chance to hear more and learn more about that. But that would now would be the time because it's not on the agenda elsewhere. But let's hear from George. So I just want to give you a little preview of something that's happening tomorrow morning at 8:30 at Davidson Middle School. We're having a gathering of student experts talking about some of the key findings from the Youth Truth Survey. And we're also planning one at Venetia Valley coming up very soon. And I hope there will be an opportunity for us to give the board a comprehensive report on the great work that our young people have been doing all this year in the student voice effort so that you can understand some of the amazing things that our key members of our key stakeholders of our community have been doing to make things work better for everybody. And that includes teachers who are under a great deal of stress dealing with this extraordinary challenge that we faced the last two years with the pandemic. We've got to work together as a community, as a village to resolve our problems and we're making real progress to do that. Thank you, Board of Trustees. Thank you, Jim Hogaboom. We're making progress. There is light at the end of this tunnel. <laughs> Thank you, George. And I uh, ask our superintendent <laughs> to think about that student uh, mm -hmm. a report on that from, for us. Mm -hmm. Be very great to hear. So anybody else? No? None. Okay, so um, we'll close that item and we'll bring it forward for a staff report mm -hmm. about the English learner reclassification update. Mm -hmm. This is one of our priorities, one of our top, top priorities for the board, and we're very glad that you could be with us tonight. Yes, well, thank you. Thank you to the trustees and to Superintendent Hogeboom uh, to give me just a little bit of time tonight to give you all an update on our reclassification numbers for this school year. Um, it's a pretty brief um, overview, so hopefully we can still get on break on time. And then, of course, if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer those. All right. So as you know, reclassification is the process where we look at uh, multiple data points and we look at the criteria that we have in order for an English learner to be reclassified as fluent English proficient. Um, that's it. <laughs> I just thought I would like to leave with kind of basic. I kind of like to pre present how I teach, just, you know, kind of re reignite some prior knowledge. Mm -hmm. So we can go ahead and pass that along. 
Um, we have four criterion that we use to reclassify our students, and they're aligned with the state criteria. Um, the first being an assessment of English language proficiency, and what we use in the state of California is the LPAC exam. So that's the first layer of uh, requirements or criteria. Then we look at a basic skills assessment, which basically is our district-wide benchmarks and any other kind of summative um, assessment data that we have on students to make sure that they are progressing. For older students, that may be grades, it may be how they're faring on reading inventories, um, teacher-created assignments, teacher-created uh, testing. For younger students, we rely heavily on reading inventory, um, Fontes and Pinnell, and then the math uh, benchmarks. And then if the students are meeting those first two criteria that generates uh, reclassification forms and a list of students that have qualified, we send those to the sites. And with the support of site principals and then their language appraisal teams, um, they will review the paperwork. The teachers will um, give their input to see if the student is ready to be reclassified. And then the final step would be to consult parents and explain the process and um, we haven't heard of a parent yet that has not wanted their child to be reclassified. So that's the final step. Everything gets updated in ARIES. And then that child um, will then start the, pro the process of being progress monitored for four years, which is the RFEP progress monitoring procedure. So even if they reclassify, we're still keeping track of them for, for four years. <laughs> Just in terms of meeting reclassification criteria, as you all know, if you've learned a second language, it's it's huge to learn a second language. It doesn't happen overnight, nor do we expect it, nor do we want it to happen overnight. In terms of normative progress towards learning a second language and becoming proficient in it for academic purposes, um, we're looking at about a five to seven year process. And that's when a student is fully immersed in the language, ut utilizing it not just for social interactions, but really in academic content, which is where our big push around integrated ELD comes in across, our, um, across all of our PD efforts and our instruction. Um, proficiency is also age and context dependent. So if you review our reclassification criteria, it looks different in second grade than it does in 10th grade based on what's developmentally appropriate. Um, and this is the big kind of takeaway of this. It, do, it does take English learners longer, or I'm sorry, they do need to make more than one year's growth in order to catch up and to reach English language proficiency. The LPAC exam is quite rigorous. It's, it's, it's very similar to the CASP test. So students really have to dominate the English language and have that academic language under their belts in order to achieve proficiency on that exam. The next slide. Um, so we're gonna look just a little bit at the elementary uh, rates for the last five years, high school, and then we'll kind of put those together and talk about why the data looks the way it looks. So if you look at this, this chart right here, it's just pretty much has the raw data um, in those first two rows. What we looked at is knowing that it takes five to seven years, we were basing it on the number of English learners at any given school year um, that, that met that criteria. So four years or more. So if those numbers on the top row look small, it's because they are. That doesn't include any student at English learner that have been in our schools for less than four years, any of our newcomers. Um, but you can see which of that 17, 18, I was trying to remember back of that Hi, why we had so many students that year, and I honestly can't remember, but um, the second row shows the number of students in that year that we reclassified, and then below is just the percentage of that. So you can see that in elementary, 17, 18, we were at 19 percent. We took a big, um, made a significant progress in 18, 19, and I'll explain kind of our, our thinking about why that happened. And then we started to dip down in 19, 20. And then you can see in 2021, the direct result of all of the interrupted schooling. And quite honestly, we could not complete LPAC testing that year because of COVID. Everything shut down when we were right in the middle of, of, um, of LPAC testing. Um, bright spot though, the numbers are not as high as we would like them and as high as they need to be, but we are bouncing back, which is indicative in this year's uh, 132 students in K-8, mainly fourth to, to eighth grade that we have reclassified this year. So that's a bright spot. Same data table for high school. Um, here you see lower numbers in terms of the number of students reclassified. There's a few reasons for that. Um, in all honesty, I, I was asking Lori Owens what happened in 1819. Um, and truthfully, there just wasn't a follow through in getting those forms 
turned into the district office. So that's just an example of how we really do have to be able to offer some centralized supports to schools, which we are doing now. So we learned from that mistake. We don't ever want that to happen again. Students that are ready to be reclassified need to be reclassified. It's a game changer for our students to reach that proficiency level. Then we see a similar pattern, 1920, 2021, taking a nosedive. And despite some indiscretions there in the middle, we are up to 51 students this year, which again, it's something to celebrate. Um, we've been a lot more um, just really keeping a very close eye on not just the process of getting paperwork back and forth, but following up and providing some technical support for sites and individuals that are part of those LAC teams at their sites to make sure that they're understanding the process. All right, and then the next graph basically just shows uh, elementary and high school combined. So you can see that trend that we made that um, leap in 1819 and then things started to go down and now we're starting slowly but surely to creep back up again. So the story behind some of these numbers, if we just look at the LPAC test in general, there's been a lot of changes that have happened over the last five years that have greatly influenced reclassification. The first being, in 1718, we made a shift from the CELT exam, which is what we took for several years, to the LPAC exam. The LPAC was a lot more rigorous. It was based on the 2012 ELD standards, which the CELT test was not. The CELT test um, was more based like on the, the earlier standards, which tend to be kind of a laundry list checklist of language skills, whereas LPAC really does look at like the holistically what it means to be a, a proficient speaker, reader, writer, and listener in any in a, in a second language, in this case, English. Um, the South test had five levels of proficiency, which were, you could kind of see the trajectory of a student moving through those five levels. Whereas LPEC has four levels that are, again, a lot more layered in terms of what the expectations are and what the kind of the criteria and cut points are to move from one level to the next. Um, and then the other thing that happened in 1819 is the students took the test in 1718 for the first time, paper, pencil, 1819, it went to an online format. So now post COVID, everybody has a Chromebook, students are used to using it. In 1819, we did not have Chromebooks, especially in the elementary um, grades. I mean, we had them, but it was a cart that you would roll around and use for special projects. We still had computer labs on most <laughs> of our sites. So that's where we see that dip in 1920, mm -hmm. because the, so any given year's results are based on the year before test administration. Mm -hmm. So we know in 1819, when they took the exam for the first time online, we didn't see as many students qualifying for reclassification in 1920, which is one of the reasons why those numbers are lower in 1920. Um, 20, or sorry, 1920 and then 2021, again, COVID just hit us all in the gut and, we weren't able to complete the testing. And then even last year when we came back, as you know, the K-5 as opposed to 6-8, as opposed to 9-12, there was a different kind of phase back into in-person. It was really hard just to get students that you have to test them one-on-one. -on -one. And it was really hard to get students either at the site or online at the right time, or if a student was um, scheduled to take a test and then all of a sudden they're on a test to 10 or a 10 day quarantine. So there was just tons of challenges last year in really completing our LPAC assessments. But even still, we were able to get enough students tested in order to raise our numbers, really double our, our amount of uh, reclassification this current school year. Some of the things we've implemented this year is we have new reclassification criteria that um, offers a little bit more of a range in terms of students. As we know, every student, every learner kind of learns at their own rhythm and at their own pace. So you may be at the lower end of a range or the higher of a range, but you still can demonstrate proficiency in different ways. So that's been a helpful shift. And also this year, we really targeted working with our special ed teams around alternative reclassification. And that's something uh, Principal Martin spoke to around duly identified students. So those are students that are English learners, but also have a documented disability, an IEP, a 504. And we do have alternative reclassification criteria for those students if we can demonstrate that their disability does in fact impact their ability to, to pass the, uh, the LPAC. And we were able to reclassify several students this year under the alternative reclassification, which is really great. Um, one of the things, another factor that we, we foresee 
impacting our reclassification in the future is that the state is currently working on uh, some new criteria around the teacher evaluation. So California is really trying to standardize the way teachers give their input and their feedback and their recommendations around, um, around recommending. So that's called Optel. That's set to go to the state uh, board like in, I think, October, November. So we expect that to, to impact us, maybe not for the 22-23 school year, but we're already starting to prepare for what that might look like in terms of, of kind of shifting our criteria around a little bit. So where do we go from here? Um, this just gives us some ideas and some, some next steps to think about in terms of increasing our reclassification rates. It is one of our key goals around supporting English learners in our LCAP and in our Together 2024 plan. The first kind of uh, system is kind of things we can do centrally and we can support centrally. And then the second is really, what do we need to see in our classrooms and how we can support our teachers so that they can, they can um, address the needs of our, of our English learners. So um, quickly, the close monitoring at services, um, really paying attention to those cycles of reclassification and that timeline to make sure timelines are met, to make sure that if principals and their language appraisal teams need support, that there's somebody there to support them, walk them through, review their referrals if, to make sure that everything is aligned. Um, also, uh, you know, we have some schools that have very high numbers of ELs. So we wanna make sure that we're giving them additional support because it is a time consuming process to go through the reclassification checklist. Um, also, we're looking at ways of how can we improve our data monitoring so that we're looking at data more regularly and quickly so that we can do something with it in the moment rather than just waiting until we get these results and being like, oh no, what if we had done X, Y, Z? Um, also, we really need to focus on our long-term English learners and our students at risk. We spent some time at our last principals meeting doing some shared reading and some shared understanding around that. So now the next steps will lead to putting some, some key actions into place. Um, because at the same thing that uh, Principal Martin said, long-term English learners have a very uh, specific kind of profile. Of course, there's you know, variety within that, but we really need to look at the engagement and how can we do things differently so that they can still achieve the skills, but in a way that's engaging to them. And it, hopefully in a way that can actually help them catapult them into future career. Mm -hmm. um, and then keeping our parents informed, it's so critical. Again, I'm copying from Principal Martin. I wish she was here so she knew I'm still, mm -hmm. we were thinking, we were aligned. Is parents need to know, they need to know what the reclassification process is, where their child is in that reclassification process and take the time to sit with them and kind of walk them through so they know what the next step is and how they can support and what supports are already available to them that they might not even realize. In terms of instructional practices, that daily integrated ELD is critical. Language is not learned in isolation. It needs to be taught throughout the day across all curriculum. So if we can work at identifying that really high quality professional development that offers our teachers some really protected planning time, some perfect protected staff training time to meet the needs. I mean, we have to respond to these numbers. So if we know research-based that that's one of the ways that we can improve our reclassification rates and our outcomes for English learners, we need to, to put a lot of eggs in that basket. Um, and then also uh, focus on academic language and student talk. We want our students talking, talking, talking all the time. We need to model appropriate academic discourse for them. And using um, ongoing summative assessments, which a lot of uh, teachers and teacher teams and departments are engaged in that kind of work now through their PLC work at their sites or the way they're kind of looking through their data cycles in their teams. And um, much like letting parents know where their child is in the process, we need to let students know really clearly, this is where you're at, these are the areas you need to work on, this is how I can support you so that they have some ownership over their reclassification. So that is my presentation. Um, we're gonna end on a positive note. So we have 183 students to celebrate this year. That's amazing. We're really excited about that. And for the first time, we're going to have a district reclassification ceremony. So, and you've all been invited. I hope yes. that I think you received yes. your formal invitations. Christina got them all out in the mail. Perfect. So that's definitely something to celebrate. And we've got 
I feel like this year is kind of our new baseline. So we can keep moving forward and working closely with our site teams and with our leadership to really keep this front and center because I can't say it enough, this is a game changer for our students to be reclassified. Right. All right. Well, thank you so much. It's a it's a fire hose of information, well, but yeah. I know I we are you. all drinking it. So I, I know that there are going to be questions, and we'll dive into this. So be patient with us because, Absolutely. as you know, this is what we what we're here for. Um, so I'll go to the screen first and see if anybody has any questions to kick us off. Uh, that would be Talia. Okay, Gina Daly, please. Well, Cecilia, thanks so much for this presentation. And especially, um, it really seemed like a lot of the issues we had in the past were just not having the right systems and structures in place yep. to be able to do the, the tracking and the, you know, the assessments and for kids that were ready to exit and be reclassified, just it wasn't happening. So this presentation really showed me why we needed to create your position. And uh, so thank you for being in this position because we, to your point, we wanna make sure that every kid that is working so hard to get to proficiency um, gets that acknowledgement. Um, and I love that we're doing um, a, a ceremony to acknowledge that big step. Um, my question is really about, um, and this came up a little bit in the Madrone presentation as well, but the longer term ELs, and how we, so obviously we're talking about reclassification, but for, for students that are not getting reclassified, I wonder if you have any update in terms of the long-term ELs, because I, I know we've talked about it at a few board meetings. Um, yeah, I have an update in that I have the numbers. I don't have them on my screen right now, but I'm happy to share that with you. We shared those numbers out per site with each principal um, before spring break. They got some reading to do over spring break, and then we discussed it last time. Mm -hmm. We're really looking at, there's a big um, push statewide around looking at long-term English learners and what are some innovative ways that we can really address their needs. So mm -hmm. some of the ideas that are floating around would be, for example, to do a reclassification conference with with all of our ELs, truthfully, but really we need to start with those LTELs and the kids that are at risk for being an LTEL. We need to look at the duly identified students who are long-term English learners. Um, another idea that we have is to look at some of the CTE slash ELD courses and how can we mesh some of those classes. And truthfully, most long-term English learners, and I think I've said this before in a, in a past board meeting, they really are English dominant. It's just the academic language that really they need some support around. Mm -hmm. So how can we kind of switch the narrative and instead of call it English language development, can we call it academic language development and maybe couple it with the CTE course? We've seen that model in Elk Grove. That's one of the models that the state is highlighting. Um, so we have interest in exploring that so that students can be not only getting the language that they need, but they can also be getting some technical career skills that could serve them. Um, and then another thing we're, we're kind of dancing around is doing some focus groups next year with our students and doing some EL and LTEL student shadowing, because I think it's really important for the big people in this, in this business uh, to, to kind of walk in the shoes as much as possible to see what does the engagement look like, when are those students seem to be kind of like charged up and ready to go and participating, and when are they just kind of falling back and kind of, you know, De disengaging. Um, so those are some of the ideas that we're floating around as a, as a leadership team. I'm going to be following up with individual with site principals and prepare something very similar to this, but just for their school so they can see their five-year data and set some specific goals uh, for their sites. Okay, thank you. And we'll see here see if our student trustees have any, no? And trustee Martin. Oh, Cecilia, thank you so much. What a great presentation. I know it took so much work. Um, just a quick question, and you don't have to have the answer, but I know that we have, I think they're called community liaisons at some of our schools. Mm -hmm. And so in, you know, I have second graders, so I've, I've helped support some of the community liaisons translated for them. And I'm just curious, are they aware of, um, and I, it sounds like it's a new structure and system, So I know a lot of families go to them. So I'm just thinking about their communication roadmap, right, as they're mm -hmm. communicating with families, are they aware so they can also help socialize that this is a process, there is a structure? Um, I'm just curious if they're aware of that. Yeah, it's actually great that you said that because we have our community liaison meeting on Thursday. We meet with our community liaisons once a month. And I'm basically going to try and replicate what we did with the principal group mm -hmm. with the community liaison so that they also have access to some of the research 
and then um, how they can support the families and understanding that. And I think it's very easy to, to push this into DLAC. It's a required topic in DLAC anyway, but how can we bring this to the site level in a charla or in an ELAC meeting. Exactly. And yeah. um, we have an amazing group of community liaisons. Some are newer, so they, they do need some more training around this because they haven't worked in this yeah. kind of capacity around some of the compliance mm -hmm. stuff that's required with ELs. But I do think that we have the right group of people that have their heart in it and they're very smart that can help, can really help keep parents engaged and informed of this. Okay, thank you, yeah. Okay, Trustee mm -hmm. Bama. Yeah, I just thank you for the presentation, Cecilia. I'd like to share that uh, I'm really happy of the job that you're doing as a EL director. Uh, but I'm more pleased to share that I, I attended the like meetings. Uh, you present to the parents, you are teaching them what reclassification is all about, and they're starting to to get it, they ask the right questions. Mm -hmm. And I really love to see the engagement that you have with the parents and how you facilitate these meetings mm -hmm. and the, the teams that you bring in for all of us to learn. Mm -hmm. So I think we're going the right way about it. I like the new ideas that you just mentioned after Gina's question. Mm -hmm. So we are looking forward to see how that will take place. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Yeah. Hi, thank you, Cecilia. Thank you so much for this. I, yeah, everything my colleague said about it. I just had one, one question. Um, so my, I come in from a perspective of someone who also did not go to school in the United States. So I did not take a lot of the tests. I, I, I am not necessarily familiar with all the tests like Sophia and Italian and, and everyone has to take as a student here. But I did take the bar exam, <laughs> the California bar exam, which is very complicated. And what I want to say about that is that testing is difficult. And you're already saying that all the stuff that it's difficult to test. So how are we also teaching students who some of them are coming from another country? Like I also have to learn how to test in the United States. I, I get it at another, it's a different level, but um, what, what kind of testing skills? Like what are we doing to ensure that we bridge that, not just the language, which is obviously part of it, but we help them prepare for the test itself. Yes. So you're talking a little bit about focus groups and things like that, but I, I just wonder what, we, what, what are your thoughts on that? I, I feel like that's an area where potentially students need a little bit more support. Yes, and for sure. It really does depend though on, on their background knowledge. So what we see, and I'm sure Molly can attest to this yeah. as a teacher, that if a student is coming to us and they're pretty much academically at grade level mm -hmm. in their home language, they tend to transition very easily because they have those skills embedded. Mm -hmm. It's more of the language piece and they're able to transition. When you have students with gaps in their education, we have to focus on those fundamental skills. I wish testing wasn't our main focus because that's you don't learn through a test, right? You learn through good instruction and, and ample opportunities to practice. LPAC does have some practice tests that teachers can give and some teachers do give that. Um, I think there's opportunities there for us to utilize those exams a little bit more. Mm -hmm. But I also think one of the key points really is that road to reclassification. And we need to be realistic for some students, like where do they need it? So it's very typical scenario to see students that pass the listening and speaking and reading. They're showing a little growth. Writing is an area that a lot of students, that's what's keeping them from passing the LPAC. Mm -hmm. So if we are getting more kind of dialed in to where those students' strengths are yeah. and where their areas are, then there can be more instruction, more explicit, uh, kind of explicit explanation of this is what you need to do. And then as a district, how can we support our classrooms? Because like I said, at schools with high number of ELs, it's a lot of students that need the support. And you also still wanna to teach to your grade level standards. Um, so there's no easy answer to that. I think just having been in education for so long, you just have to have your bank of, kind of strategies and tools. Yeah. And then you have to look at every student individually. Every year that group in front of you is different. So you have to teach differently every year, but the longer you do it, you have like your toolbox. Um, so I think aligning that capacity within the classrooms and then really making sure that centrally central office and kind of where we put our mm -hmm. emphasis on, our dollars to, those need to be directly to support the, the teachers in the classroom, which ideally support the students in those classrooms. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. I asked almost all my all my questions, <laughs> so I'm going to. But I just have to say, 
just don't give up before the miracle. So, you know, for years and years, we've been watching and waiting and complaining and just thrilled. It shows the importance of having this position mm -hmm. in our Absolutely. district and having someone who's going to stay with our district and, and, and carry these things through and supporting yeah. our staff in their work because we know they want their kids to be successful, but mm -hmm. they need the support of the district office in making that happen. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in hearing more about the long-term English learners. I'm interested in learning more about um, the support that we give the students mm -hmm. when they um, come out after reclassification and how they do mm -hmm. um, and what uh, and what happens when they aren't really successful. So I know you've talked about that a little bit in the past, but maybe I'll have some data um, for us. It always felt like for long-term English learners, I always thought they needed to get a get out of jail free uh, pass card, you know, because they were stuck. Um, in, in mm -hmm. learning in, in that last thing about writing. Mm -hmm. And writing is very hard. Yeah. And we don't really teach um, manual writing anymore. So it's almost triply hard for yeah. students who don't. And, and maybe we need to think about how we mm -hmm. can help with that manual part, especially for the younger learners. Yes, and that's where the oral language, the yeah. daily academic vocabulary, tons and tons of, t of student talk, that's where that comes into place. Because mm -hmm. if they can articulate their thoughts, we can teach them how to write them down. Okay. But we need to give them the opportunity to say it, say it, say it, say it the right way, say it the wrong way. We'll step in, we'll model so. So that's the last part. So I do some work with older adults in Marin, in Marin County, and I know they're all ready to start volunteering again because they had to shut all that down out of their life for the last two years. So um, I hope that you can think about you know, how we can bring in volunteers again to be, because you, you said speaking with our students, yes. uh, for yeah. students having that talking. Um, I do know when I was in the Peace Corps and learned Spanish, there were a few people mm -hmm. out of our cohort of almost 40 people that could never mm -hmm. get that last part. Mm -hmm. And to think that they might have been stuck for years just because of that. So I'm glad to hear what you're sharing about mm -hmm. the state being a little more open to helping students get that get out of jail free card uh, and be able to access the other things at the high school mm -hmm. level particularly. So yes. I'd like to learn more about that when you, if you come back and absolutely. how that's working for our students. And celebrate the bilingualism. Right? Well, absolutely. So really, we'll have yeah. that. That's, a, that's kind of the, the, we're trying to slowly say instead of an English learner, you're an emergent bilingual speaker. Which is amazing. So. Um, getting them into uh, Spanish <laughs> Spanish classes so they can learn the grammar of their, of their home language. And so our superintendent has some last words here. I do. I have a question and a comment. So one thing to remind the board is that we're sending, I believe, about thirty of our teachers and administrators down to the Abbott Conference in San Diego this summer. Mm -hmm. um, to see is going. I'm going. I know Katie's going. Um, I think great. Mr. Statchin's going. So. Excellent. One of the purposes of that is um, not only to give teachers effective strategies, but also to kind of agree upon the three um, most important strategies that we want all of our teachers to be using. And one of those is probably going to be teacher talk, although we'll see. Uh, because student, student, talk. student talk. We got teacher talk. Thank you. We, have enough teacher, we have enough teacher talk because the yeah, studies show that a lot of times in those EO classrooms, the REO students are not talking at all. And that's mm -hmm. not the problem. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that could be one of them, but whatever comes out of it. So we're really looking forward to bringing all those teachers together to bring critical mass people that haven't gone mm -hmm. to conference probably, if at all, mm -hmm. um, in the last few years. And so we're really excited about that. And my mm -hmm. question for you, um, Cecilia, is when do we give the LPAC? You mentioned that we could give it at different times, but do we like, are we gearing up to give it like in May? Are we, do we give it in like, like when do we give it? We generally started in February and it has to be completed by May 31st. So it, we're in the, we're in it right now. Um, we used to give it in the fall mm -hmm. and now that, that timeline shifted from the state. So the window is February 1st to May 31st. And we just do like, get people to go out to Bahia Vista and give it next week for the week or something? Or yeah, typically we schedule it so that the schools with the higher number of ELs are tested first. Um, and then there's amazing team of LPAC testers that go because the listening and the speaking have to happen one-on-one -on -one and they're recording all of the information. And then depending on the grade, the younger grades, it's a little more, it's, it's right geared for little ones, but um, second grade and up, they do the paper pencil for the I'm sorry, they do it online for the writing piece. So do all EL students take it or just if the teachers decided that they think they're ready to pass? Oh, no, every every English learner has to take it. And actually, when you first enter school, you have to you take two um, LPACs the first time you first enter the initial LPAC, which kind of gives you your baseline. 
And then after that, every year you take the summative mm -hmm. exam until you can test out. Um, so every student takes it. Once you're reclassed, obviously you don't take it anymore. There are a small handful of students that are IFEP, which means they take that initial um, LPAC and they pass it. So they, they're, they're initially fluent English proficiency. And that's usually the case of when a parent has indicated on the registration or at the home language survey that there's a second language spoken at home that's not English. So it kind of prompts the English learner. Um, but there may be they may be really bilingual at home. They may have older siblings or the, their parents may be speaking just two languages at home. So, yeah. Thank you. Good. Well, thank you very much. We yeah. look forward to uh, learning more and seeing you at the yeah. reclassification. Yes, I'm excited. So, <laughs> okay. see you all there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So we're going to take a short break. We'll be back um, in a few minutes and we'll get the sign up for everybody in the public mm -hmm. watching. 
No te vayas a caer. Welcome everybody. Yeah, we're going to need to go home. Yeah. Back to order at um, 8.34. And we are now going to get into our discussion action items. And the first one up, well, I think we believe we have three of them. The first one up is a first reading on student services. And that's with uh, Jason Simpowick. Please come forward and give us the, the uh, background we need for this first reading. Right. This one is pretty straight into the point. So this is board policy 5021, non-custodial parents. Uh, so this is the first reading, uh, it really just highlights two main points. Really the first being uh, that the parent, parent or guardian who actually physically enrolls the student in the district shall be presumed to be the child's custodial parent or guardian. Mm -hmm. um, and the second point talks about um, unless there's a court order restricting access for one of the one of the parents or guardians, that, that it should be presumed that both have equal rights to the student in terms of picking them up, accessing records, visiting at school. Those are really the main changes to this policy. Super um, short to the point. Okay. And these are from state law. Yes, state law. That was passed last year. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Any questions on this one? No, we but do I have one. I'm Trustee I'm Martin. Glad. Makes sense. I do Go have ahead. a question, and I just was I'm learned so I'm very involved in foster care. So what happens when besides those two parents, if like can a foster parent also get access? If, if the, I know it's, well, I can take this offline with you. It gets really complicated. I just learned about how complicated it is listening to this young adult um, talk about, yeah. Yeah, it, it gets very murky. Um, so my default is always, if you have something from a court showing that you have the ability to make educational decisions, mm -hmm. then we will allow that person, their foster parent or even just a relative. Okay. Um, yeah, it is, it's complicated. Okay, so just some type of legal document. Okay, <laughs> awesome. Yep. Thank you for that. So I appreciate I, it. Yeah, I want to talk with you too if you could get in touch because of the caregiver provision. Hopefully, there's a caregiver provision in there because I was that for a high school student. Um, not, uh, she was living independently, but she was still under her parents' care, but they were not involved. So, so we, we and we used to care do her affidavit. Mm -hmm. Is that and does that still hold for this? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I had a conversation with the family today about that where um, they want their child, their high school age student to live with a relative here in San Rafael. And so they have to fill up with that caregiver mm -hmm. affidavit and that caregiver has to kind of show the proof that they mm -hmm. Right. And assume all responsibility for that student. Mm -hmm. As Lucia says, I learned then that it's an important document for immigrant students yeah. too. So, okay. So that, that's good to know. This is the mm -hmm. first reading. So uh, we have one more question here. Just no, well, I want to oh. say that uh, um, I'm glad that this is finally going to, officially it's going to take place because as a foster parent and adoptive parent, that has been an issue because the schools do uh, listen to the biological parents mm -hmm. and the foster parents and the adoptive parents. So it hasn't been clear and it's confusing, not only for, for the person who's actually in charge, but for the child also. Mm -hmm. So um, when will this take place? If uh, when, when will it be effective? Uh, so this is the first reading, so we will come back to the May 9th board meeting mm -hmm. um, as the second reading. So if it's approved at that point, then it goes into the next. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Glad. Good. Thanks so Thank much. Look forward Thank to seeing you in two weeks on this one. Absolutely. And you have some other items on here for consent. So second reading. So thank mm -hmm. you for your work. Thank you. Yes. Our next second item is first reading on an ed services item for board policy 6170.1, transitional kindergarten. Mm -hmm. so, right. so this um, is an amended board policy from last year's based on the updated TK ed codes. Um, and what we've tried to do with this one is map out uh, probably the most important change in here is uh, what eligibility will look like over the TK rollout. So you'll see as you read it, it says for the 22-23 school year, for the 23-24 school year, right? We've tried to map that out according to what um, the state is currently asking. Um, so that is in there. The big kind of changes you'll see is we follow the state guidelines. And then if we have additional room, admitting additional students 
that would fall under the next year's eligibility. So those additional two months. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what's, yes, it's very exciting. Um, so that's what's in here right now. Um, and then the other kind of updates that you'll see are mostly things around uh, adult to student ratio. And so all of those are what's in um, state and code right now. Um, and this is also a first read. And so we will bring this back to the couple weeks. Okay. See if there's any questions. I Can you here. explain the first part, how does it work at the two months? Can you give me an example, please? Because I'm, I'm I lost. am going to attempt to give you an example. Okay, and then if you, you can. That. If no, that's okay. I have to default to a written piece of paper okay, sure. that I have written out 14 times every okay. time because it is confusing. So okay. the way that the state <laughs> is expanding the window, okay. this is a, a, va a generalization, but I think it's the easiest way to think about it. Okay. So right now we're at December um, 1st or 2nd, I can't remember. Every year, they're going to add two months. And so if you just map out, so next year, we're going to add December and January birthdays. Then the year after that, it's going to be February and March birthdays. And the year after that, April and May birthdays. And when so, does it start, Stephanie? Sorry. Next year. The, the, the start of the eligibility. Oh, September 1st. Yeah. Second. So every year you're adding on a two month window of eligibility for kids, basically getting younger, closer to four as they start coming into TK. Mm -hmm. Into TK, but not kindergarten. Not kindergarten. Okay. Into TK. So, so if you were born September 3rd this year, you, were, you cannot start kindergarten. But next year you would be able to start kindergarten? This is where I need my uh, my. Okay, card. that's it's yeah. very complicated. But it's a yeah. no, so it's a good question. So, what what we're mapping is when the kid turns five. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's what the eligibility is. When is the child's fifth birthday? Yeah. So I'll use my son as an example. Okay. He was born December fifteenth. Okay. And he turned five in twenty this year. Twenty. What year are we in? Twenty twenty two. Twenty twenty two. Five in twenty twenty one. Twenty one. Okay. But his birthday was outside the TK window. Mm -hmm. So he, because he was born December 15th and the TK window ended December 1st. Exactly. I hear you, girl. So he didn't qualify yeah. for TK this year. However, <laughs> next year, he would have qualified because we're taking December and January birthdays, kids who turn five all okay. the way to TK. 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 Or TK. Yes, I follow you. And then you add two more months. So you still have to be, you have to turn five by September 1st to get into kindergarten. Now. No. Not no. Now. No. Now. Well, yeah, you still have to be into kindergarten. In kindergarten. Point, then yeah. If not, then you're going to go into TK on this rolling yeah. time. Yes. And then eventually it'll it'll just encompass four-year-olds. Is basically like the kindergarten cutoff date, only it'll be four-year-olds for TK is where we're going to go over the next four years. It's, it's not really right now for all TKs because no. some kids are being enrolled because they were five because then they turned five and they're still not in TK, or they could enroll in TK, but not kindergarten because of their birthday. Say that one more time. I think I can, I can help yeah. you. So when they changed the entry date for kindergarten mm -hmm. and they moved it back and made it so the kids had to be older, they softened yeah. the blow for those groups yeah. of kids mm -hmm. by giving three months of kids an extra year of school, mm -hmm. okay? And so now if you're born in that golden window, you get an extra year of school, everybody else doesn't. This is the state's attempt to gradually increase the eligibility so that everyone will go to TK. So everyone will do TK first and then kindergarten, but they're they're staggering it in two month increments. Another way of word I use is phasing it in mm -hmm. over a, mm -hmm. what, a four year period. Right. Um, we've been doing TK for just the first three months mm -hmm. um, for a number of years now. Right. Mm -hmm. um, rather than telling school districts you got to do all uh, four year olds. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, they're phasing it in over a period of years. But there are parents like you. Um, I'm sure there are many parents mm -hmm. who are kind of stuck in a transition. Okay. They, didn't, they, they weren't included. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can I, yes. can I give yeah. an I, I'll give an example that I think might help us understand this. Okay. So uh, my son is a five-year-old, going to turn six in June, he's in kindergarten. He was not eligible for TK because he's a June birthday. My daughter, Juliet is three years old, has a February birthday. So she has one year left of regular preschool. And then she will be eligible for TK because by that point, the February birthdays will be included. You're doing a great job. Yeah. This is literally- I may have looked job. into this. 
yeah. how much more daycare would pay for. <laughs> so when do you get into TK? So Juliet will be in TK in 23, 24. It depends upon the year and the birthday. Yeah. So you can get into TK being three if you're about to turn four. You so will, we you don't know. So you not have three-year-olds. In you always have four years. Okay. That's it. Uh, is it, I mean, thank you. It's, it's really month. confusing. I literally write down the year exactly and the dates of birth. Exactly. That's the best way to do it. So it's it'll take time for us to figure it out. Well, yeah, as long as you know the date of birth, I think that's like and up to the cutoff date. Yeah. yeah now what year will all four-year-olds mm -hmm. on September 2nd be, be eligible? Be eligible. Uh, 25, 26. 25, mm -hmm. 26. And we're in okay. So I think great. that uh, a couple more years. It, it's good to know. It still hasn't clicked that I, to say uh -huh. that I can memorize it and and and, and share help. it with, with parents, no. but that question will come up. So maybe something in writing. So yeah, they can like a, vision, a picture, whatever is uh, saying, they because I know there is a concern of some children not being eligible yeah. for pre K. Yeah. So we need to have an answer for those questions that are already coming up. Yeah. So we've tried a few different visuals, all float them by some of you guys, because they don't quite work each time. It's like it makes sense to some people and not. Yeah. Um, so we can float those by you guys. You just can tell us which ones seem to make the most sense. Mm -hmm. okay. It's going to be a different visual every year. It is going to be. Different. It is. You just change the month. But at least for at least for this year. Yeah. And then we have a meeting coming up on Wednesday, yeah. and I know parents are going to ask about that's gonna that. That's the first question. And that's one of the uh, questions that will come up. And there's one, there's one way to show it. Picture. That'd this be great. But most uh, recent visual. You know, some, uh, we'll, we'll bring it. Yeah. Something. So basically, yeah. for next year, if you're Brit, they, they, they turn. Four in September second to February second. Five. Five. That's right. Then they can be enrolled in TK. Okay. And if you have questions, shoot us an email with their date of birth and the year they were born. So <laughs> all of it. And I, like I said, I've just got these visuals tucked on my desk because it is hard. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you. This is the first reading. We'll look forward to uh, uh, adopting this. In couple of weeks on uh, May 9th. And then we have uh, business services items. Omar Cucci. Yeah, thank you. We have some donations to recognize tonight. We have two, both for Laurel Dell. We'll say Laurel Dell seems to have a way of getting some of these donations, but we have uh, a generous donation from Lindsay Holtaway of $150 to Laurel Dell and a $400 donation from Kaiser Permanente Online Giving Foundation oh, nice. to uh, Laurel Dell. So total donations tonight of $550 to Thanks. Laurel Dell. We know that they're all going for a good cause. Uh, need a motion on this one. I move. And second. Okay, moved by Vice President Martel Dow, seconded by Trustee Palma. All in favor say aye, raise your hand. Aye. Okay. And we have now 18 consent items. One of them has been pulled. That would be item number 18. So I understand that will come to us at a future meeting. Um, so we have 17 items. Does anybody want to pull an item for a question or comment? Seeing none, I'll take a motion to approve the items one through 17. I move that we approve items one through 17 of the consent agenda. Who's up? Martin. Okay, seconded by, okay, moved by Vice President Martel Dow and seconded by Trustee uh, Martin to approve items one through 17. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, so we have uh, com completed our agenda. Our next meeting will be on Monday, May 9th, and we look forward to seeing everybody then. Have a good few weeks.